guys. So yeah. Yes. Oh. So everybody's know so the call is started recording, okay? So before yeah. you called Ramon, I was listening to this discussion about so it's a, a wealth thing. And it was basically about, you know, like going green and solar panels and batteries and everything like that. So I put the question in, who will be responsible for the disposal of the batteries? Well, the answer was, it's a good question. <laughs> right? And my, <laughs> and, my, and my response is, well, until that's sorted out, you can't call yourself green. You know? Um, so it was all about solar and that, and, and, you know, like I've got no problem. Yeah, every rooftop, stick some solar panels on it. Yeah, good idea. But once you're building solar farms, well, you're killing biodiversity. That's my view. Um, if you're building dams to create hydro, again, you're killing what's naturally there in diversity. So yeah, it was just interesting listening. And it's all about new money chasing old money, I think. Well, old money chasing new sources. Um, yeah, that too. Uh, yeah, I was talking to my colleague yesterday, and and talking about those uh, those lights and magnetic rings and all the rest of it. And he said oh, when yeah. he was he was talk, he, he talked about a magnet which was fairly large. And I, when I say large, think about those ring magnets being meters in diameter. Anyway, yeah. uh, his comment to me was that they'd set he. He'd been involved in an experiment where they set up this power generation system using a ring magnet, and it was generating um, 5,000 volts. Uh, sorry, 5,000. Yeah, 5,000 volts at, or was it 5,000 amps at 100 volts, which is 500,000 watts of power, and that was from a, a large ring magnet. So. Um, our power generation mechanisms, um, if he's been playing around with that sort of stuff, is you know, pointless. You know, solar solar can't compare. You know, if you're talking about no. ring magnet and things like that, you know, solar farms are a pointless waste of money. Um, yes. So, and batteries to store this power. Well, you why would you need a battery if you if you're directly grabbing it from the um, the uh, ionosphere mm -hmm. and the planet solar system, you know, it's not needed. So, yep. we're, we're well, putting on that, in. On that cheese fella that I sent the one of a bit over a week ago, I've seen some more of his work, and he's got one where he actually, so he describes it as like you'd have, so you have, you, you have two, and you have them in pairs, and you have like a rail system. And he described it like a train track was – and moving what you'd call the sleepers on the train track, the angle of them, would move these around, which would give you your drive. But I thought the way I listened to it was um, you'd have – on one side you're two southern and on the other side you're two um, north, right? And the way I seen it was you'd really have to have it – pushing, not propelling, a way to create that that sort of energy that he was talking because once it locked onto it, it'd just lock to it and go to it and stay there, wouldn't it? What would keep it moving? Well, you, you need what I'm talking push. about. You need a push me, pull me effect, which is what the photon yeah. does. So yeah, got... and that's what he was talking about with this one that he was showing and, and that. And it was interesting whether it would work or not. <laughs> Anyway, well, keep going. The issue with mechanical solutions is that they uh, they suffer friction issues. Even even yep. even even that light light circuit we were arguing about two 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 times ago was uh, you've got electrical resistance in there. The, the discharge is actually causing a friction effect, and it will actually heat up over time. So yeah, um, and so it will degrade. The, the actual device over time as well. So um, yeah, I don't, we we really we we're, we're only just beginning to start playing with this sort of stuff, and we really don't understand the actual dynamics. You know, I, I I've described this in 
in, in the past where I was saying an electrical discharge is an aether field sets up a conduit for transmission and and everything along that transmission is immediately ready for a discharge and then the discharge event occurs and you've got photons traveling through a medium and it, you know at the speed of light so you'll slowly see the discharge conduit light up as friction events kick in and then the material that gets sucked along travels you know very slowly like millimeters per hour or something like that and you'll eventually get the arc to form but the actual electric circuit across the conduit is almost instantly established. Uh, you know, you wouldn't, it, it, you'd have to have a very long line before you figured out how long it was taking to actually establish the circuit. So when we look at transmission uh, phenomena, um, the, the, the actual things that we think is the uh, speed of circuit switch on is actually a speed of how fast does the friction elements kick in before they become visible because the electrical circuit or the magnetic discharge or whatever we want to talk about it has been established instantly across the entire length of the conduit so our understanding about how circuits work i think is not quite right and there's a difference between switching networks which is what computing is doing in terms of circuit delay processes versus the actual you know, transmission of electric and magnetic power throughout the structure in the first place. They're, they're two different issues, and we keep joining them together and saying they're the same thing, and we've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. But proving it, of course, you know, you need to, you need something that can detect the aether field being reconfigured, which means you need some sort of fancy field detector because photons won't do it; they're too big in terms of field structure and, and they're absorbing this material too so it's um we've got quite a some distance to go but we definitely need superconducting behavior to actually see the fields take pictures and things like that Yeah, no, no, you, you're right, but, you know, it comes down to, um, at the moment, everybody seems to be happy to go along with uh, the solar and wind systems, and they're what seems to be getting the money, because they look like they're a pretty safe option, if you get what I mean. Well, it's safe-ish. You know, like... You know, even, even if somebody wanted to build nuclear, it's very difficult for anyone to do anything even with nuclear um, because it's also viewed as not quite yeah, but right, we, I suppose. The big problem for a lot of these power infrastructure, or even just, you know, normal, you know, buildings and stuff like that is um, the cost of making sure that they're safe is, is claimed to be a, a waste of money exercise. And the best example of that that I've ever seen was um, there's a Brazil, Brazil's petrochemical company, the big one that's in, it's based in Brazil. The guy in charge of that company said, uh, we need to cut our costs on, on, on maintenance and things like that because it's hurting our profit, our profit line. Anyway, they had a huge drilling rig, which was, I think it was worth $3 billion or something like that. And its annual maintenance bill was like two hundred and forty million dollars. And they said, "Well, we can save two hundred and forty million if we don't don't do the maintenance the way it's scheduled." And within eighteen months of that decision, that three billion dollar piece of hardware was at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, that's right. And the guy got walked out the door and told, "Well, see you later. Don't ever come back." I don't know what happened to his bonuses and all the rest of it, but he cost the you know, if you don't pay for the safety insurance uh, and making sure that things work properly, then there's going to be a big cost at some point along the line. And you see that happening in, uh, you know, Three Mile Island. Well, that's, and, like, uh, that's like just maintaining your car. Yeah. If you don't drink the oil, say, on its schedule, um, 
you, you, it, its lifetime gets decreased considerably. And the same if you look at most things we use that need maintenance, if the maintenance that's not, isn't done within schedule, its life cycle gets wanna, deteriorated pretty quickly. I just want to point out to the audience, if they were wondering where Billy Gilberton is, he's still around. Look at this. He, these are these are new his favorites. These are new videos. Smarter Every Day. This one came out two weeks ago. This is the Veritasium we were just discussing. So that bloke who talks about the Ivervectum and that, I've listened to him a bit, that doctor bloke from England. Yeah, well these right. are just I've listened are, to him a bit. And, and 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 yeah, no, that's pretty good. That yeah, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad it's Billy Elverton's around somewhere. Is your privacy an illusion? Yes. <laughs> Just keep your head low. <laughs> you know when when you're talking mandatory vaccination and getting fired if you don't get vaccinated, we're talking what the Nazis did when they came to power in Germany. You know, the very first thing they did was they said, well, if you're a Jew, you're no longer a, a citizen of, yep. of Germany and um, you can forget the idea of earning an income. You know, and within, what, five years or so, they were just killing them. So I'm, you've got to ask a question of, you know, where where is this stuff heading? And it's, it's I don't see it going to a good place, that's for sure, because we're creating a... A them society, you know, the unemployment, the people who, who haven't got a job are a, a drain on society. There are them we need to get rid of. Uh, you know, you can see this crap coming out of everybody's um, country, really. But, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question of why are the people who are searching for jobs unable to find them? And the answer, short answer is they don't want to pay the wages. You know, they're not interested in employing people. They'd rather have a computer system to do the job for them. But you know, it's it's just bullshit. Really. I'll bring somebody. I'll bring somebody in that they can pay a lot less. Or it's cheaper. Yeah, we've, we've got. And then when they're finished with them, and then when they're finished with them, send them home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I bought. My wife bought a, one of these uh, rotisserie cooker things. It's glass bowl basically with a with a fan force on the top. And um, the glass in those systems is supposed to be thermally treated. In other words, they, they don't fracture under heat. First use of this sunbeam cooker was the, the, the lid, the glass on the lid broke. Mm -hmm. like, like car windscreens used to do in the 60s. You know, you get all this nice, lovely cracked, yep. you know, shattered glass. And, you know, you send off a letter to the... Uh, to the um, to the triple uh, to the consumer protection guys, and they say, "Oh, you got to go to the retailer to get your warranty fulfilled and all the rest of it." And it's sort of saying, "How stupid are you, Mister Employee? That's supposed to fucking look out for the is the is the product safe for public use? You know, is it up to the job? And you know, the fact that this lid shattered is justification for a total recall of that product across the world until it's fixed." Where was it made? China. Where is the uh, where is the uh, emphasis on making sure those bastards use the correct materials? Yeah, but could you? Could, could, but you see, do you definitely do you definitely blame the Chinese manufacturer or the company that got it manufactured there for not ensuring that it was okay and right in the production process? Well, it's the company correctly. trying to, trying to reduce its costs. And, and, and whoever's in charge of the company and their management team, they're the ones responsible for the fact that a product of this sort of defect got out there in the market. It should not have happened. No, I agree with you. And, and when, those, when those things are being made in places other than China where the rules don't matter, um, you're, it, the only reason why they're there is because it's cheap to do. You know, Instead of paying a dollar per lid, they're paying... 10 cents per lid you know, it's like the, it's like that car that you know for the sake of a, a, a fraction of a cent they they didn't reinforce the fuel tank and it, if you got hit the right way the people in the car got incinerated that right uh, that was that ford one in the late 60s yeah, P, P76 uh, or whatever it was in america <coughs> yeah you know 
And when when the jury in the and trial, they did, and they did, they actually did. I have actually listened and read a bit on that. They actually did. The company actually did, and they worked out it would be cheaper to pay out the um, uh, court costs when they got when someone took them to court and won, than to fix the problem. It was a big yes. business decision, and basically the system allows them to get away with it. In other words, I could do that, but if I've knowingly done it, I should be then treated like anybody else that's involved well, in that's right it's a form of me well i'd call it manslaughter it's murder it's murder you've made a decision that you know will kill people yes it's like well and, going out and, and 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 pointing it towards a crowd and pulling the trigger you know that's your chances are of hitting someone and killing them you know it's not it's not it's not a it's not a manslaughter issue at all it's a fucking straight up murder issue and it's the same with those Airbus crashes and other things that have occurred. You know, they knew these things were a problem. They refused to fix them. And the guys in charge of the companies should be just put in trial on murder charges. First degree, if, they, if, if you're going to end up dead at the result, then fucking fry them in public. Publish it. Televise it. Five hours of executives getting bloody mur destroyed because they chose go down a path that killed people. But mm. That's likely to happen because of, you know, they've paid their uh, their uh, bribery dues and they're not going to get have to suffer the consequence. But it's eventually going to get to the point where you have the French Revolution all over again. You know, being rich won't help you survive. Yeah, probably. Or you end up with it, what happened to Atlantis, where everybody gets slaughtered, <laughs> except for a small group that survived. Not me. I'm hard to kill. Well, we all would like to think that, but you know, is it true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, Ramon. I, keep, I, I, I'll tell you that I, I invited someone the other day to find out, and he didn't. Uh, he hasn't so far taken me up on it. So. <laughs> well, you know, he knows that he's likely to lose. That's, uh, well, that, that tends to happen when you invite people to a gypsy knife fight. Yeah. <laughs> their their first thought is, well, what's that? <laughs> their second thought is, I don't think that that sounds like a lot of fun. And to no. me, it's on a, on, a, on a day when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, tend to be a little depressed, a gypsy knife fight sounds like a right good old hillbilly fun. <laughs> yeah, but well, it would be a great way to get rid of that pent up crap energy, wouldn't it? Yeah, I sure would. Right, yeah, like, and you take it out, and you take it out on some other poor harmless soul. <laughs> <laughs> you swap it. <laughs> Thanks, mate. I'll give you this. The bank with gun. A poor, poor harmless nothing. He he picked up the knife. <laughs> Should have never done it. <laughs> well, sometimes people are a fool. <laughs> right. Uh, it's like but, the bank robbers. You know, they come in waving their guns around, trying to threaten people, and. They don't want to shoot anybody, but more important than that, they don't want to get shot. <laughs> so, you know, well, you know, that's the likelihood if you're going to walk into a bank waving a gun around. So, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question, what are you really trying to achieve? They just, that, it's not well thought out, is the issue. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's, that's the truth. I mean, uh, in general, I think that criminals don't think things think, uh, think things through. And people throw around words, you know, rather flippantly. Um, yes. But you don't yeah. have to be a criminal to do stupid things. <laughs> no, you don't. That's for sure. Look at the guys that, you know, decide to jump off a roof because it might look cool or whatever. And, or, or when they've got the pool frozen with ice in, in North America and they're jumping in to see if they can jump on the pool to see if they can break the ice. And, you got to be wondering where their brains born to. <laughs> they seem to assuming they were born with any. Well, you know, it's great to laugh at them being idiots and hurting themselves, but it's not really that funny. It depends on the context, I think. I'm a great fan of uh, Hold My Cosmo. Not because necessarily um, they're fools, but because it's just some of the silliest uh, things I don't understand. And it's obvious, uh, you know, most of the time it is alcohol related. Some of it's instant karma. Or I drug do, related. I do enjoy some instant karma videos. 
Uh, but you know, guys, I've always admitted I'm I'm kind of sadistic, so you know, I'm just, <laughs> that's just the way I am. You know, so I uh, I enjoy that kind of stuff. I I like watching bullies get theirs. I like watching those kinds of videos. I love a good instant hero. You guys had you guys down in Australia had that uh, that kid. He wreck he had had enough of being bullied and slammed that one kid over. Uh, and uh, I tell you that that right there made my day for about. Well, that happened. That happened. My son went to a school and it was in the judo learning martial arts and all the rest of it and there was another kid who was probably a couple of years younger and he was short and the the school bully thought he'd have a go and, and the younger kid just decked him and um yeah they left him alone after that they weren't going to annoy him anymore and then of course the the the, the club went went down to a contest and they had their picture in the paper where, it, where you got all the kids there and uh suddenly my son, they stopped annoying him too because they knew that these guys in the judo club were uh, not to be messed with. <laughs> not if you like to walk away from the, you know. So yeah, things got a lot easier after that. Maybe that's what we should do is, you know, publish in the local press the uh, the kids that are involved in judo and all the rest of it and you just watch, you just watch the behaviour of all the kids that get to see that, you know, and then they realise what the consequences of annoying someone might be. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, a lot of people should think about the consequences of things uh, once or twice before they go doing it. In this guy's case, he decided, because I said that you, you need to question the federal government, he, he called me a traitor because he's like a statist or whatever. Yeah. And uh, that's when I said, well, I, I reckon that you know, I'll offer you a, a free lesson in MMA, boxing, on the mat, in the ring, wherever you like, or you can, we can do a gypsy knife fight if you if you feel like. And uh, he, he suddenly got real quiet. <laughs> well, isn't it the duty of the citizenry to question and hold its government accountable? Yeah, it, that's, that, that, so, that is actually the definition of being an American patriot. But, so, you know... That's your like, citizen criticizing the unit, the government and questioning it is not an act of treason. Correct, it is not, and this this person is a fool. But you know, that's what democracy it. is. That's what democracy, true democracy is. Correct. Where people sit around and and debate, well, debate, discuss, criticize, whatever you want to call it. Fascism is where you can't criticize it. Correct. <laughs> yeah. It's not, yeah, not. This, guy, this guy was this guy was not not uh, a real good citizen. He just thought he was. Yeah, well, he didn't know what a citizen was. No. But, um, what you've got is dictatorship or authoritarian behavior of the government, and that's not constitutional. It's it, you know the ism type that goes with that of, um, authoritarian mechanism is. Uh, doesn't really matter, you know, the kings were authoritarian, the communists in Russia were authoritarian, the communists in China are still authoritarian. Same for Cuba, Venezuela is an authoritarian socialist country. Uh, the United States is behaving as an authority nation, as is our country, and Australia, Canada, everywhere. They're all behaving as authoritarian. And they're creating the sort of environment that was existing in Nazi Germany. And every time I talk to my mate, the political mate about all this stuff, he gets pissed off with me because it says Australia's not Nazi Germany. And I said, yes, it is. Just look at the legislation, what they can do, you know. If you can walk into a doctor's surgery and say that writing a letter to the, to the Australian health minister is a, is a terrorist act, then you've got some serious problems. Yeah, I, I you know. I I would tend to think so. In Victoria, of all places. You know, there was, um, I, I was listening this morning and I thought this morning, right? So you've got, you know, protests are starting to, to gravitate from, you know, that, that throw rocks through the window to a bit of a higher level in, in Victoria, I know. But when they're doing surveys, 70% of the people are agreeing with everything that's going on the lockdowns and everything. And well, I liken it to scary. in the 18, I, well, well, in a way I liken it to there's another thing 
So that's sort of your, well, they call themselves middle class. Um, sort of like the 1890s when they invented um, bottles of rubber tubes and told women that you don't have to feed your babies anymore because you can use milk through these tubes and then they're, and then they're having heaps and heaps of these babies dying because they'll get infections from the milk in the rubber tubes. That's relatively how easily what you'd call your middle class are able to be led. Well, so at the moment, at the moment, they're able to. They've still got plenty of purchasing power, so everything's honky dory. You've got to remember the education system developed in the uh, at, well, probably from the Later. middle 1700s forward, is all about yeah. creating bah bah lemming behaviour, where the whole crowd just walks in a given direction because of social nationalism. Um, mm. They're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in what works, what's safe, or any of that. It's just anyway. Let's get off this topic and move on oh, to it? what would happen if a thunderbolt hit the Eiffel Tower. How much of Paris do you reckon would survive? A thunderbolt or a, a lightning bolt? What are we talking about? Well, a good bolt. A thunderbolt. A thunderbolt, you know, the, iron, the awful tower. A, a, a Pradian thunderbolt or a, a, an arc that's connection between a planetoid and the Earth? Well, how about the ionosphere on the surface? Um, there's there's a seven thousand three hundred right. tons of metal in that tower. And I was beginning that if, you, if, if, if that space elevator that Arthur C. Clarke was pushing in his 2010 novel, if they built a building that went up that high, I reckon they'd have a huge problem with electrical discharge down the tower, down the down the down the elevator. And I'm just wondering how long the ionosphere would last if it's continually discharging to the surface. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I tend to. Be it wouldn't last very long. Um, but you know, I. I well, I don't I know it's, because it's a conductor, so it's kind of hard to know with that much steel. I, maybe portions of it would be uh, melted down, and some of it would be left at the bottom. The blast would be more likely to destroy it than anything, because these these lightning bolts even they create they can destroy uh, eight feet crater. They can create eight foot craters in gas station parking lots. Well, they can drill into the earth down kilometers into the into the crust. Yeah, and that's that's just you know, I mean that's that literally. Just, uh, that that's just the uh, the lightning bolt. I mean, we're talking about something way beyond a lightning bolt. Yeah, but you know, the amount of energy up there in the ionosphere is pretty staggering. You know, hundred seconds of input, and it's. Uh, you can stop the earth from spinning. It's the same quantity of energy. So it's just, these are huge numbers. You know. So what you what you sort of surmising then is Robert is the Eiffel Tower would become like the attractor. The right, yeah. And, and within and, and within nanoseconds, the Eiffel Tower would be this would no longer exist. But you've now got the connection forever right. for however long. To where the Eiffel Tower was. Yeah, and you got a plasma it might stream. Be a short time, or the plasma stream might hang in there and go for a, a reasonable time. And the longer it goes, the more damage it would exactly. cause eventually by the creation of earthquakes, volcanoes, and everything well, else with it. It'd be pulverizing a fairly substantial radius around the tower, and they'd be being sucked up and Hold into the plasma stream, so you know it's going to be doing a lot of damage. You know, yes, it would look something like a nuclear event in some respects, but um, I don't think much of Paris would survive. Well, I'd say. Well, I mean, people in their uh, in their shoot, or do you mean the blast, or do you mean the step voltage? Well, all of it. Really, you know, you get an X rays and gamma rays coming out of the process. You got RF frequency. The electrical network of Paris would just simply shut down. Um, it might just be that it, it uh, 
You got all you got. I would, the I would assume it'd take out about sixty percent, but I don't think it'd take out the entirety. It would certainly be devastated, though. Yeah, you got the Seine River next to it. You've got the underground rail system and and all the metal piping and power distribution systems. Which would keep it going. Which would would, technically keep it running longer because you've got the drawing. Yes. So So instead of and and it doesn't have to be Paris, you know, if the same thing hit the Chrysler building or the Sears Tower or any of that sort of stuff, you get the same effect. Because there's a lot of metal in the in the city infrastructure, and it's all you know relatively close to each other and easy to connect up to. And of course, you've got lots of water around, which doesn't help, because the water pipes have become conductors as well. It wouldn't wouldn't be just the metal bits. Mm, just like that, three uh, electrogeology researcher pages done. That's how it's done, people. <laughs> so under uh, under the researchers, the, the, there's the electrical uh, electrogeology. And now we have the four main ones, um, and then we'll need to, to get uh, Mungo Jep. Oh, I'll need to create his page too. Let's see if I can. Where do I? I may not have him in here yet, actually. We'll add him in. And we'll put him up here. Go ahead, guys. I'm just, uh, you know me, I'm just doing my thing. Yep. So, we'll yeah. I'm, start, I'm, we'll, start, just, we'll, we'll start talking about something after this. Well, I was just wondering if, you know, if. If whatever caused Venus to occur re-happens, I don't think any major city on the planet would survive for very long. Oh, well, no. People would devolve pretty fast. I mean, already we spend big money on superstition. I just left. I just went to the Ghostbusters movie. Most people think that way. They don't have an understanding. And even in the movie, the little girl, you know, she's all she's all for science, but she believes that the uh, the pyramids are built with slaves. You know, and then the, the the science teacher is talking about how pure science is, and it's it's radical, and it and it, and it solves everything. And I'm sitting there going, boy, these people really don't understand science at all. Well, it it the issue here is they've seen a massive transform of society and and what what we're capable of in in a very short period of time. Right. Uh, so yeah, there's a reformation and a counter reformation. So you know, it's only been what 400 years or thereabouts since 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 this stuff started really in the modern era. But in terms of the damage that that these events could have caused, you know, you got cities and buildings everywhere that have got so chocker full of metal that if we've got these sort of lightning bolts going off, it wouldn't really matter where the society's in chaos. The lightning bolt coming down and smacking into a into a city or, or a set of cities would, would be even more devastating than having a nuclear war. You know, the damage that would be done would be catastrophic. Because when these things go off, if they hit the power grid, you can kiss your generators goodbye and all your amplifi- amplifiers and transformers along the way. Well, I heard Greg Allison talking about that yesterday on his channel. And apparently in America, I can't recall what year he said it was done, but there was some report done for the government in America, and they worked out if you had a proper system, um, uh, what's the name they called it, the Sun um, Nova or whatever it was. Anyway, yep, yep, took out, totally destroyed the power infrastructure, right? They reckon within 12 months, nine out of 10 people would would have perished. Well, I think the number is closer to one in a thousand would survive. But well, that's actually that's actually what he he didn't say that, but he said that, and that's being very optimistic. And but that within a twelve month period. Yeah. So yes, over a two or three year period, you'd probably come back to that. Well, I yeah. think it would be a lot faster than that. I, you know, within within two months, I think you'd see the death rate pretty high, and then. 
because of that, you'd have disease vector mechanisms kicking in due to of the course. number of people who have died. But the real issue here is that, that report, I believe, came out in 2014, and they just said they don't even have the spares. You know, That's right. The, some of these transformers are 18 months in construction time, yeah. and they just don't have the spares. So the just-in-time delivery system we have good developed over the right. last 50 years. It's all based years. around hurricane seasons and blizzard seasons and nor'easters, and that's it. Yeah, but we don't have, we don't go back 50 years, you know, the idea that you'd have two years worth of food supplies and, and infrastructure to deploy in the case of a major disaster of the sort we're talking about. We're more likely to survive these sort of events in the 60s than we are today. It's just got worse. And COVID-19 has just shown completely how stupid our critical in-time delivery systems are. You know, the damage that the, the fact that, you know, a city shuts down or something like that is uh, tremendous. And it doesn't really matter where they're being manufactured. If you can't, sh can't make it and ship it, then it doesn't really matter. And governments and, 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 and power structures haven't figured out that you can't just put the manufacturing of product X in one location. It's got to be distributed. And they, they don't want to do it. They don't want to pay the price of doing it. Because that would mean everybody would have to get paid a similar wage for doing the same sort of work. And they don't want to pay that, that cost at all. But it's really a furphy because you know, nobody gives a rat's ass how much a system that works costs. They only care about it even if it doesn't work. Right. I'm doing a Jeff's page. You guys want to comment on some of his uh, his stuff the, down there? I mean, he's Australian, I think, isn't he? I mean, he's he certainly. Okay. Value did a the DVD down there the 1492. I can't remember where he's from properly actually, but uh, he did the uh, 1491 uh, the comet destruction in Melbourne. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's he, from, he's I think he's Melbourne University from memory. Yes, yes, no, that was really good. That yeah, I've seen that was Philip Bay was created. I've seen some of his videos, but you know, he wants people to pay for it, which is fair enough. You know, he's putting the effort in, but I can't afford to buy it, so I, I'm not really I'm, that. Why can't you afford? Why, why can't you afford some DVDs? I mean, you know, just skip a couple of McDonald's meals. Well, I don't have McDonald's. We don't. We don't the have Macca's. McDonald's. Meals. Skip the Maccas. We don't have it. The closest Macca is a five-hour drive away. Uh, so if we're going okay. want to get out, you know, you, you know. get the point. You get the point. Yeah, I know, but you know, there's a limit to how much, how much uh, money I can spend on things that I'd like to do versus what I have to do. Now let me, let me ask you this: Do you think that that could be related to? Uh, uh, what do you think that's related to? Because I, in my opinion, that always comes down to. Uh, belief systems. So mm -hmm. I, I constantly have too too much of everything, too much of time, of, of uh, energy, too much of interest, too much of projects, too much of people who want to work with me, too much. I got money to spend on crap, and then it piles up, and I got to get rid of it. You know, I I never I never seem to have a lack. I mean, and I'm not trying to brag or say that I'm you know super special or anything. But I, just, I think that it flows out of my out of my out of my uh, science so i'm just curious like uh, where do you fall on that does what i noticed in the, alt, the alt stream has a lot of people who don't seem to have enough but they have a lot of interest in things and, and in growing things for other people and that that always <coughs> makes me very curious it seems like we should be able to grow our community well That's, you know well, my, 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 income, income, but you go, my income's reduced you know, i'm a care of pensioner so that, that gives us you're a what? You're a what, pensioner? I've got yeah. disabled people I'm looking after, so they pay you money to do that. Oh, okay. But the mm -hmm. amount of money, right? If I was, if I had a job, 
if I was working for a private organisation doing this job, the, the, what I, the work I would do would be in the range of $90,000 a year. But I'm only being paid $25,000 a year. And I'm a real big drain on the government because I'm saving them the difference. And, and why, uh, why, are, why are you being paid so little? Because why would you, I don't why would you accept that? I'm just curious. Well, to, to, to be, you know, getting the 90 grand income, I've got to go and get the jab and I've got to obey their, their autocratic rules. And I'm not the slightest bit interested in doing that. Are you saying that you were making that much before and now you're not? Well, before I got into this game, yeah, I was I was I was in the ninety thousand dollar bracket. But what did it give me? Not nothing significant. I've got you know, the real issue here is that, you know, it's a case of having sufficient for your needs and not trying to have more than you actually want to have or need to have. So, you know, it's why do I have to get the million dollars all the time? You know, what which is, you know, crazy. But the, the thing that's got me in the last 12 months is the skyrocketing property prices and rental for, for dwellings that has occurred in this country. You know, it's not like that the houses have suddenly become um, yeah. a place or something like that. But we're talking people spending, um, if you're buying a house, you're spending more than half your income to the bank just for the privilege of living somewhere. It's just, the rent is not as bad, and the rent is even worse. You know, and there's been there's been well, no. Why, why, do you guys, why do you guys stay? Why do you guys stay in Australia if it's getting so bad? I haven't figured that out either. Well, once you, uh, you get out of Australia, you need the bloody travel certificate that you've been vaccinated and the rest of the crap. And then, because everybody wants to keep you out of their their little, uh, you know, what's perfect for everything, you know. They don't want you to go. You know, if you wanted to, Australia, this is a classic, right? Australia was set up by let's send a bunch of criminals to this colony so we can get rid of them out of England. And 200 years later, you can't come to Australia if you've got a criminal record. What the fuck happened? <laughs> you know, they uh, sent the you've got, you've got fat and entitled, is what it sounds like. This is the problem yeah. of uh, socialist. Uh, well, all throughout Europe and the West is that the, the people that get things easy and then they, then they think that they deserve it. And what's funny is, as far as I can tell, almost none of these motherfuckers deserves anything. I can't yeah. find any. I can't. I You know, when it comes yeah. to people who really deserve it, you see them like they're hobbling or they're disabled or they're a veteran or something. They've got a lot of outlets. They've got a lot of uh, government programs, et cetera. But it's all the rest of them that doesn't seem to deserve it. And here in America, we're having a problem. People don't want to work. They don't even want to work at the at the Walmart or you know the McDonald's. I mean, there is signs up everywhere about needing help, and these yeah. people don't want to work. Why? Because welfareism and welfareism seems to destroy. It's now it's not just destroying the black community; it's destroying every community in America. And I just don't understand how Europe has even maintained this, managed to stand on its own. Uh, legs and in, in all this time, I mean, I, I just can't believe it hasn't already collapsed because it's certainly on its way. But you've got all the countries that are in, all the people are, that are not in those wealthy, quote, wealthy countries or look like wealthy countries, they, they're hungry to come to those countries so that they can get rich and have a wonderful lifestyle as well. But, you know, the people who have the wonderful lifestyle aren't interested in, you know, getting flooded with even more people that will just work. So, you know, the whole system is buggered, you know, and and what's keeping them afloat at the moment is the, the fact that they can, the only thing that you make out of thin air at the moment, out of, out of nothing, is money. You know, just go and get some, some material and print, print currency value on it and just give it away, you know, it's, and everybody thinks it's worth something when it's not even worth what, what's written. It's not even worth the cost of getting the paper printed in the first place. Or well, in the case of us making the plastic notes, but yeah. And that's what's causing this to occur. You know, you've got a completely stuffed economy based upon lies and bullshit. You know, the thing can't work forever. It's got to fail. 
the just question is, is you know, how much damage occurs when, when the whole thing collapses. <coughs> but, you know, Ramon, when you talk about over there, how everyone's got the signs up, workers wanted, right? I remember Milton Friedman talking about that, and I thought I couldn't didn't understand it at the time when he talked about it. So he he said in the 1930s people withdrew their labour, and I thought that don't sound right. But then we're actually witnessing what he what he what he believed happened in the past. So a collective mindset came in. Why should I bother? Um, if I go and work, by the time I pay taxes, the cost of getting to work and all this stuff, I'm better off sitting home on the bit of money I get from the government. So although the government money's not great money, by the time you add all the costs in of working, right, well, I'm not going to make much more and I've got to play their game, I might as well just stay home. Right, so I, I don't blame it all just on the welfare. I blame it on the on on the total cost system that well, people. Oh yeah, uh, the, 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 the inflation is, people you, go to work. The inflation is the root of all of this stuff, other unless you yep, want to go yep. with the whole original sin thing. But the inflation is uh, by design. Um, it it robs the people of their wealth and gives it to the people at the top. It ain't the it ain't the the capitalism itself. It's the money. Uh, it's the money management. The money management is the reason. And uh, if anything, in a purely in a purely capitalistic uh, scheme, there would be no money managers. There wouldn't be nobody to centralize or put be to to put themselves in between the sources of capital and the consumers of capital. But because there are all these comptrollers and bank central regulators and loan officers and financiers and all the different kinds of funds that increase. They all insert themselves in. They have every incentive to play games with the money, uh, such as bonds. Bonds are a perfect example. On the paper, the bond seems like a good idea. The government yeah. borrows, money, borrows money from the people, gives it back to them later. The problem is it's actually a pure scam. And the, the the inflation, well, they'll never get back that money. And it is if you do it for uh, you know war bonds, you know, because we got to raise money to fight the Nazis. Okay, I got that. But the the real truth is they're just robbing these old people of their money. Now the rich people know how to use bonds. See, you can use bonds <clears throat> and uh, things like um, CDs. Uh, money market accounts. You can use those things when you can buy them in mass. When you can buy them at hundreds of millions of dollars, then you are then it makes sense. But when you're buying them because you can borrow against them, you get interest. When you're using them on a small level, like the regular person, they're all scams. And so the the question is, why do people keep participating in it? And that's where the crypto uh, revolution is coming in and it's going to change all this. All it is is game. It's straight up gambling. We can get a proper pure capitalist system. The solution, the, the, the economics of it, the way it works is you're looking for the cheapest solution to the problem you have. And the, one of the reasons why people can't find work is that people aren't, the, the, the work is there, don't deny that at all, but what what is prepared to be paid for that work to be done is not meeting the needs of the people who could do the work. And, you know, it basically it, it's, you know, an enslavement process. If you're not, if you're not going to yeah. pay for the need of the person doing the work, then you shouldn't even be offering the job. And because you're stealing from that person, you're stealing from them the opportunity to earn enough money so they can feed themselves and them, those that they care about. And if you're not going to provide people with that basic need, then you don't deserve to be called anything other than a slave master. And it's that simple. Um, you, know, you can argue about it being socialist and all the rest of it, but it's not. It's just about being responsible to the people that you claim to care about. You know, you, if you care about them, you'll make sure that they do have their made, needs met if you're the one with the money wanting the work done. Or you're the person with the resources that wants the work done. It doesn't have to be money. You can do it other ways. But if you're not prepared to help 
that person who's going to put their entire effort into giving you what you want, um, then you do not deserve the assistance at all. And it does, I don't care whether you're rich or poor, it makes no difference. You can't get things for free. And if you think you can, then you do not deserve to be supported by anybody. And you look at who defends the wealthy. Well, certainly not the people who have got the money, that's for sure. They don't want to get shot. So they go and hire out to others that you know are desperate enough to do anything. You, know, you look at the governments of the world, right? The American government and the Australian government and all the rest of it. Come here, fight our war for us and protect our rich, rich, rich benefactors and we'll look after you for the rest of your life. You go off, you get injured, you come back and you treat get treated like total shit. Um, you, 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 you have to fight the whole way to get through all the red tape to get what, what was promised in the first place. So they make all these promises and refuse to deliver on them. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's a treason. It's treason against the people who have gone out there to defend the country, paid the ultimate price. And those who Great, made those man. promises won't pay the ultimate price and won't honour their promises. Now, Ramon, a couple of days ago, um, I listened to this interview that um, JFK did, oh, and it'd probably be about three months before before he lost his life. Now, yeah. and it was talking about, you know, what are the issues at the time, right? <clears throat> and these were basically the issues that he was going to take to the next election. It was going to be. Um, country's um, defence of the country, um, security at home, jobs, because we've got so many people coming into the job market and we've got all this new technology and we have problems, especially in states like Virginia, because we don't need as much coal as we used to because we've got new technologies. Um, and what was, oh, yeah, and your health care and, and things like that. Tell me what's changed. Um, that was well, in 1960. There are, some, there are some who feel that there is a foreign, uh, and that this would be me, uh, that there is a, a foreign investment. You can't have um, a situation like during the beginning of the Iraq war, the war on terror, the the word on the street and i haven't gone to confirm this anytime recently but that the saudi arabian government owned 16 percent of america at the time well what's what freaking surprise is it then when you don't go after any terrorist cells in saudi arabia but you go after all of their strategic enemies in iraq and then you uh you knock off egypt libya syria uh, destabilize uh, and antagonize Iran, um, and all of your friends are are in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and the uh, United Arab Emirates. That doesn't take a genius to put that together. So what's going on there? The money comes with uh, stipulations, and that's it. Because the money comes with stipulations, um, you no longer control that politician. It doesn't matter if you voted for them or not. You could vote. Uh, you could vote for limited government, and you know, and then you vote in uh, John McCain. Too late. It doesn't matter. He is no different. John McCain was effectively no different than uh, anybody else, and John Kerry's the same thing. The 2004 election was controlled opposition. Both candidates were skull and bones. Both candidates. Yeah. Uh, the whole the whole reason that kid a lot of people don't know this and I always have to tell them who held the, the debt the, the don't taste me bro kid was fried only after he asked about skull and bones they let him ramble for four or five minutes then when he finally asked about skull and bones that's when they came and tackled him and tased him uh, so you know people are uh, seem to be confused as to what happened but well JFK and Eisen and Eisenhower said it military industrial complex. Secret societies. Uh, we imported Nazis and commies, uh, and we've been importing them ever since. Um, mostly the commies, but 
you know, as long as you keep doing that, it's not really a shock that your values are going to slip because then you give them posts. You had all these Nazis came in and then they were given sanctuary and, and given uh, academic positions. Well, of course, they're going to export their stupid ass ideas to these unwitting kids. And pretty soon you no longer have parents and uh, you don't you don't have firearms classes at schools anymore. Hunting classes, fishing classes. The Boy Scouts are uh, full of pedophiles and, uh, and open to uh, uh, all the genders, not just girls. It's every gender coming in. Um, and there's, there's no longer foundational because you undermine the testosterone of the uh, the nation, then you undermine the national security of the nation. Because who's going to do the fighting? The men. And if they're not men, if they're soy boys and betas, then you can take them over later when you when you want to invade. It will be only a matter of time. Forget Taiwan. They're going to take Hawaii at some point. Well, now, the issue here is, is who holds the debt in the... In the 70s and 80s, it was Japan that had the debt in America. Um, and, and through the 80s and 90s, it was Saudi Arabia. And, and post that, you're talking China owning the debt in America. And, right. and the Chinese, you know, they're the, why does China own the debt? Well, America exported all its manufacturing to China and now is whinging about the fact that they're getting screwed over. You know, it's like you can't go and blame... Um, the, the 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 communists for being nasty buggers when you give them the the very tools you know, it's like, yeah it's, that's right if you if you uh, this reminds me and many people have heard this story this uh, but it's a it's a fa it's a favorite in the south and it's the story of the little boy the bicycle and the rattlesnake have you guys heard this allegory no okay, possibly well, uh, I've heard something but the a guy guy with it's a simple story. The little boy is riding his bicycle along and he runs over a snake. He stops and he feels sorry for the snake. So he picks up the snake, puts it in the little basket, rides it home. He nurses it back to health. Then one day he's handling the snake. The snake bites him. He says, Mr. Rattlesnake, why did you bite me? I nursed you back to health. He said, you knew I was a rattlesnake when you picked me up. We helped China. We juiced up China. They were a, a backwater uh, nation in 1960, 1970, 1980. I mean, these, these people, they had 10,000 lawyers for over a billion people in the mid-80s. We gave them all of this knowledge. We just had NASA teaching them hypersonic missiles, NASA engineers, and military guy catches them and doesn't break their freaking jaws. And then people go and complain. Well, stop complaining if you if you're giving them the ability to hurt you. I, I mean, it's like handing a criminal a knife and saying, now, don't don't rob me, please, Mr. Criminal. Don't don't shoot up my school. I've created a gun free zone. Don't you respect my gun free zone? Um, I don't respect anyone that has uh, uh, either rose colored glasses or no understanding of how the world works. I feel bad for them when they go to the Middle East and ride their bicycle and then get run off the road and beheaded by a terrorist. I feel bad for them, but at some point, I mean, there's just too much stupid to survive and nature is rather strict. Uh, so, you know, Darwin's not exactly wrong. He isn't hundred percent right, but he's not exactly wrong either. Oh, People, oh, great. And, and what's happened is these things have all uh, made people weak all of the the extra material and everything and if they would just go to boxing classes and and go hunt and go hike and get some reality in them then they'd be a lot better off they probably wouldn't stop being fat but they would so that, certainly at least have a little bit of reality and they don't have, they're right no well, they're not prepared to do that anymore and that's the problem as far as i'm concerned it's not i'm not going to sit here and blame the the compassion of welfare but I am going to blame how easy subsidy for everything from sub government subsidies down to food stamps makes it for people to live rather than live off of the, the sharpness of their own teeth. And if they don't cut their teeth in something, then, of course, they're going to become weak and entitled. Of course. What else yeah, would they the do? Corporations, We're looking under the corporations are all, but oh. Ramon, the corporations are all on welfare, too. That's what I just yeah, said. You know, you, you know, it's not the people, it's the subsidies to all these corporations as well. It's a, that's a big thing. 
um, you know, and, and I agree with what you're saying on, on, on that. But yeah, we're also living a delusion. Yeah. We're living a political delusion. Everybody thinks that, there's, that the populace determines what a politician does. You know, that's not no, what happens. The politicians, yes, when they get into office, or have it explained to them this way, and Ramon will definitely uh, relate to this, is say, uh, you're the guy with the money, you come in, you have a chat to the politician and say, your successor will do what we tell you to do. That's all you have to say to these buggers. And they will do what you want them to do. Because yeah. you know, Ramon, you know, Ramon, your, your country might not have been, when you go back, to that Saudi Arabia business, you just may not have been, um, how can I put it? You probably played a good game there because I remember around 18 months ago, a big slab of the Saudi and Arabian army got wiped out in one hit in Sudan, was it? Yes. <clears throat> and, and if you have a look now, I see where you're now putting processes in place to pull out of Iraq. Right, so all of a sudden, there's this massive hotbed there that's Sudan, Iran, Iraq, Syria. Who are they going to point their guns at? Saudi Arabia. Hey, back time. It, it could very well, it very well could be, very well likely, as far as I can tell. I mean, you know, this universe is a, what goes around comes around sort of universe i was just explaining to my kids earlier because we have we're we're winding up philosophy um uh, semester mm -hmm. and i straight into the concept of of uh how the universe repays advantage disadvantage and how everybody comes to pay if you get used to having advantage all the time eventually the universe finds a way to put you through a trial and through a test to see what kind of person you are and also to repay any any sins, any debts that you owe for that advantage. And so I explained to kids why they, you know, you must have a charitable spirit and be giving and treat people well and 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 don't try to have advantage over friends and family and colleagues and even you know rivals and even. But eventually you get to the end of that, and then you're finally allowed to go out and get some gain. And everybody wants to get some gain. Fair enough. Uh, we want to get gain because that's part of our nature. Uh, whether we want to get the good, the good looking girl or the good looking car or the money, we want that. And we're allowed to have that. But there's a price to be paid long term for advantage because it says in the Bible that God hates uneven scales. It's a system of iniquity. And, and uh, when, when, we, when we make the sacrifice of gains, Question is, did we also sacrifice ourselves? Did we sacrifice who we are, who we should be fundamentally? And, uh, you know, people don't consider the ramifications of carrying that on their soul. And I, I reckon that that's really what the, the story of Anubis is about, is the, the weight on the, on the heart. And uh, if, if you're constantly trying to go out and get one over on, on every single person, that is a bad situation. So you take that and you multiply it by millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, and everybody's out trying to get for them. And they're not thinking about, you know, giving back for the nation, giving back for the family, giving back for the community. And uh, if they don't think that way, it adds up. And unfortunately, I'm not so sure that only the people who, who live that way are going to be the ones to suffer. I think that innocence will suffer. Uh, that's that's the way I've seen I've seen the universe. I think that it, it doesn't necessarily protect those who didn't live that way. But I can't help myself. I keep telling my kids to, to you know, pick up trash when we hike and, you know, keep behaving like good people, even though around them there's no incentive for them to be good people. There's plenty of incentive to lie, cheat and steal. But I just don't teach them that way because I think that it carries on the soul. One of the issues you've got is that if you're going to go around trying to get one up on everybody, you're eventually going to run up against someone who's better at doing that than you are, and you're going to get run over. Um, 100%. You're not going to win every contest, and why the hell should you have to win every contest? You know, we're not we're not asked to go and beat up everybody around us. We're asked to go out and help other people, and that 
If we forget that, then we're going to get what we don't want. And if you look at the current behaviour of politicians and society, they're about getting one up over everybody else. This is the reason why X Factor and Idol and all the rest of that crap on TV is there. It's pumping a meme that is not helpful. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I, I think it's against regulation in some respects, but the simple fact is that that sort of stuff should be not even available for TV. You know, you, you, can, you can claim that I oh, speak free speech and all the rest of it, whatever. The simple fact is, where is the right that I have to listen to everybody? Rabbit on about bullshit. You know, if they're not going to talk the truth, then why should I be forced to listen to it? You know, free speech doesn't mean you can get up there and say total lies. It, you know, it's and that's what it, that's what's happened in in America. Well, right now, unfortunately, it does. And whether what what hasn't been definitively shown is all the different kinds of lies that adults are willing to say. Which ones present the clear and present danger to everybody in society? Because you can't, unfortunately, you you won't get away from white lies and little deceptions to the people and adults do because people are full of sin. So what do you do? You know, how do you engineer a society that de, de, uh, it, it, it deleverages the advantage that, that lying gives? Because currently in our society, lying gives a massive leverage. People, people well, will go out of their simple, way to support the simple, lives of, of politicians. Simple solution is give everybody telepathy, two-way, everything's known, and then watch the chaos. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. Right. You but remember sense. that I'm not a, I'm not a person who's against violence. So, you know, oh. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's, it, it suits me just fine. <laughs> Would you like everybody around you just from looking at you, knowing everything you've ever done? You know, I mean, well, in that society, it wouldn't be that bad because uh, everybody would have everybody be in the same crappy boat. Pretty much. But, but you know, you can imagine the chaos that would occur. To oh, that. yeah, the absolute chaos. I, I don't believe in going in, in that kind of direction. It's a murderer. And <laughs> the only warning the guy would get is that he knows that people are pointing guns at him. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not so so much for going into, uh, you know, anti uh, anything that's related to fascism at all, which would include yeah, reading people's yeah, minds. But I do mind. think that politicians uh, I do think that politicians should be required to take polygraphs on a regular basis. I think every time that they take office, they should have to take another polygraph. No, they shouldn't be allowed to be in office for more than a term. But if everybody had telepathy and they knew exactly what the other person they're looking at had done in their past and was doing now, you, you, the, the people that are trying to spread this bullshit would be running as fast as they could they could to the little bolt hole, never to become, a, never to be seen again. You know, it's like you, you wouldn't need court systems, you wouldn't need jails, you wouldn't need any of that shit. The only so are they all petrified rocks, Ramon, that you got there? Uh, I'm, I'm fine for the electrogeology. I'm just finding different uh, some of my favorite formations from around the world. And of course, you guys remember this one. Uh, that is. is now more on the internet is called Uluru rather than called uh, Ayers Rock, which is an interesting change, yeah. and, and and that's fine by me. I don't, I'm not from there, so Uluru is the Nike. Uh, I know, I, I, I can put two and two together, but my point is that it's going to be funny one day, no one's going to call it Mount Kilimanjaro, they're only going to call it Denali, and I think that's interesting. Well, I don't want to say to when it's stats. But when it has to do with geological features, it doesn't really bother me that much, to be honest with you. Well, there was in the uh, Kimberley, there was a a, a a mountain range after the Belgian King Leopold that's been changed because Leopold was an arsehole. You know, it's all... <laughs> okay, well, yeah. Mount Augustus might be another sandstone. The difference between this one and Mount Augustus is, is the area around it is not hilly. 
Yeah, there's so many electrogeology features. I'm having a hard time finding, uh, just deciding which ones I'm going to include for sure. And you got pictures there, that, wouldn't they? Some good photos there. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty amazing. No, well, some one, of them you had there before the Grand the, Canyon. Good. The green one with a channel on the one side. That's that's petroglyph stuff all over the place. Yeah, that one. It's not bad. That's not bad. Where is that one? Utah. This is the one that is in is Robert's paper. So one of the one of the sites where you see that it says uh, Hawthorne in the chat. Um, that that is uh, an upheaval dome. He's a researcher that wrote it on the upheaval dome. So I, I mean, there's so many electrogeology examples that it's really kind of a shame I have to limit them for the page. Uh, we're now getting to the site, you know, I really need to keep a database of electrogeology. Um, there is a map that we did, and maybe that's the, the solution is to just put a, put up my Google map on here. Um, I'll look into that in one second. Let me uh, handle this. What's interesting is that blue feature around the center. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, Pretty fascinating. And of course, they, they want. They, Blue is they want, cobalt. Green is copper. Uh, 200 hasn't all been dug up, Ramon. Must be wealth in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they got all sorts of neat things going on in. Uh, Let's see here if I can remember where the maps. Uh, da, da, da. Let's go to my maps. I know I'm pretty sure I got a map that's like an electrogeology map. You know me. Yeah, you had one the other day that had a lot of pointers on it. Ancient. Da, da, da. Nope, here we go. Electrogeology map. Here we go. So we just need to add more sites, really, fellas. Um, I believe I had a yeah. So there is a uh, there's a submission form, and I'll be glad for people to to go in and start adding. Of course, I got my stuff that I do research, and then there's some stuff over here. You got to get ship rock added and everything, but we need to get some of these places from around the world that we now what know. About, what about the structure what, in some what, south south off the eastern coast of South America, right near Antarctica, between. Yeah, the no. Here, here's here's what we'll do. I will give you the submission form, and as long as you put in the 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 coordinates need to be in the decimal format. Um, but as long as you put those in there and and get you know the proper name for the site, um, then I will re-import and we'll update this map. So so let's include this map in on the electrogeology page. We'll put it. Uh, We'll put it. We'll put it in between these these two pictures. How about how that sound? Insert doo, 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 map. My maps. Electrogeology map. Boom! Look at that. Mm -hmm. And we will uh, we will yeah, grow this. Explain. We'll grow this map, and uh, the people will be happy happy for that. I might as well go ahead and name these so that people know. These are some of the bigger, you know, great examples. Of course, the catch could, uh, could be on here. Or a cat probably should be on here, but. You know what I'll do is I'll put it uh, after the Atlantis paper in honor of uh, old Jimmy. <laughs> oh, what a joke of, you know, he's made of that. Uh, you know how many people he has given that fake news to? It's hundreds of thousands of people. You'll find them on random videos. I reckon the I of the Sahara is, is, is Atlantis. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, it just goes. And let me tell you, people. Okay, they could be watching here right now. And they're going, "Wait, I thought that was a great, uh, a great theory." Let me show you, my friends. Oh, you mean Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Church? Is that who you uh, talking about? Bright insight, yeah, bright insight. So, <laughs> so, 
So my my friends, who, whoever is <laughs> watching, let me explain to you why the Rakat cannot be Atlantis. Number one, when you look at the at the uh, formation in three dimensions, it tilts downhill. It's not level. There are no mountains to the north of it. The That's actual nice. rings of the structure are not. They don't even don't. They don't even meet. They're not concentric in the least. Uh, they wouldn't hold any kind of water at all. So here it is. Here's this Atlantis. Here's this Atlantis thing just stuck in here. Uh, oh, let's see. Statement. Here, Roman, while you're talking. Oh, hold on a second. The first hold thing. Is let, me, let me finish the list of of problems. The land itself, where it is, has not been um, under sea level in the last 20 million years. The uh, the site where they find whales, that's because a mega tsunami washed through and dumped whale carcasses in Mauritania. So there are multiple reasons why. Just because somebody stuck an image over top of this to make it look like it could be the concentric rings of Atlantis isn't, doesn't mean it actually uh, works out. If you look, it's not concentric rings at all. Uh, they, they frequently don't even meet. This is, and it has all sorts of fracturing in it. This is electrically carved, and it's signs of a Birkeland current, period. All right, now go right. ahead. Agreed. But in the Atlantis legend, Atlantis was located at the center of all the world's oceans. Where is the center of all the world's oceans? Well, I mean, that's an arbitrary on the sphere. That's arbitrary on the sphere. Well, it's not really. If you look at the, you know, forget the Arctic Ocean. It, le it legitimately, technically, is arbitrary. It's a sphere, so there is no middle of all the oceans. Look at the world from the South Pole and tell me what surrounds it. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you can look at Antarctica that way, and I would reckon, I would reckon that Antarctica well, is probably. probably I would reckon that Antarctica probably is Hyperborea because the, the planet flipped over and there's all sorts of stories of a continent in the north. However, we're talking about a continent that would be a thousand uh, miles outside of the uh, Straits of Gibraltar here. Uh, yeah, which the pillars of Earth. And yeah. what's there is the, 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 the giant island of the Azori Pla Azorian Plateau, which has collapsed because it's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Very straightforward. The SOC was where that another continent existed. But if we're going to go down, you know, the center of the world's oceans, it, it, Antarctica is at the center of the world's oceans. Yeah, and so it could, very well could be lost. Uh, that could be where the, the civilization was housed. It's possible. I don't and think so. A but. colony could certainly have existed if the, for the Sargasso Sea when it was a landmass there. You've got ocean currents in in the Sargasso Sea where fish are trying to breed, you know, because that used to be, you know, part of a continent. So, you know, we, we've got no idea what happened in the past. We've got no, any date given is, you know, a furphy at the best. You know, point to me to the person who's lived for the last 20,000 years and can verify the dates. The right. answer is there is nobody we're aware of, you know. We, we, we'd have to hope that, you know, there's ETs that have got records of that material, that uh, those dating mechanisms in a manner required by modern science. You know, they just refuse to accept any evidence anyway. And even if the ETs could prove it, they'd still deny it. So, you know, but that structure in the Sahara is the problem with it is it looks like a spiral. And you get and a Birkeland current produces a spiral. It's not circular at all. It's a helix. And and yes, you can come up with the argument that oh, the big flood dumped all the sand all around it and filled in the ocean bay that was surrounding it in the past. Well, let's, you know, let's make up another myth type territory. There's no evidence right. that that was right. true either. So, you know, that's, you that's, get, that's my point is that Jimmy didn't even bother, you know, and then and I posted about this. When you when you go back to the period, the 12,000 years ago period, the sea was lower, if anything. Yes, 400 meters. But this entire area was even further from the sea than it was than it is now. Yes. So he's completely made up 
uh, all of this to suit his, his personal pet theory. Well, let's ignore and the evidence. Has his, his version of smoking gun, but it has no, it, it doesn't support any water. Literally, it can't support any water. It physically would dump out. And that's exactly what's happening. You can see here that when a mega tsunami washed across, it flooded in and it flooded out again. It can't hold any water. So it's it's a complete waste of time. It's dry for a reason, folks. It doesn't hold water, and it never it never did. And in the last twenty million years, and this 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 structure wasn't even here those millions of years ago, because it it has to do with the, the time the catastrophe came through, and a large arc connected. And here's the most pertinent thing: this arc this arc connected along this roughly thirty degree mark here, thirty to forty degrees or I'm sorry, 30 to 25 degrees, and then desertified the area. The same thing that happened down in Australia where you had, you know, the, the Ayers Rock connection. Same thing you have in the Middle East. I mean, it's been reverse terraformed by the, the, the thunderbolts have blasted it. The same thing that happened over here in Western China. Uh, and the, the, the Chinese oh, legends yeah. talk about the dumping of the dumping of all sorts of water. And the same thing that happened down here in Peru around Lake Titicaca, then all this desertification comes from, and, and then the Southwest where Andy Hall does his work. You can see where the storm was functioning because you have massive amounts of desertification. And the desertification happens because the natural structures were destroyed by the amount of energy. And it's just taking time for it to recover because it's only been a, few, a couple thousand years. I mean, the, the, a lot of these land masses that have sunk, sank in the last 7,000 years, including Doggerland. You know, all this in Doggerland and Fri uh, Frisland and um, High Brazil, all this around here, this all sank in the last 7,000 years. Now, Z Zealandia over here sank 20, 25,000 years, something like uh, that. But uh, these these ones in the Western Pacific and then over here in the Eastern Pacific, th that all sank in the last few thousand years. Sunderland is both Sunderland. sank and became covered in uh, in water uh, in the last ten thousand years. So all this stuff is pretty recent. I reckon that the planet looked quite a bit different even just fifteen thousand years ago. For sure, but the other thing you've got is um, you are you going to create a map, or do you have a map of the super volcanoes, like the one that's off to the east of Kenya, the one that's in the structure off the south? east of uh, South America between Antarctica and I South America. That would be a good, um, in because my paper, I, think, I don't know. I think them. they're electrical, electrically generated features. you got the well, ones. Well, just, like, just like on Mars. Venus and Mars, yeah, I would say so. I mean, Tamil Massif, Tamil Massif has been, has been slowly sinking. It's the, people don't know this. It is the largest. See, when I was a child, everybody said, oh, the largest mountain in the planet is Mount Aloha. And that's true. To an extent, because it's the it's the largest going from the sea up to the upper altitude. But Tamil Massif is the size of Texas, and it's here east of Japan, and um, it's been sinking ever since. So the question is, why would it why would it get so large, and then why would it sink? It was probably electrically connected, and then it was and then without that electrical connection, the crust has been sinking below because there's no uplift, there's no pluming happening underneath. Uh, from these electrical connections, and uh, anecdotally, that the a lot of the volcanoes, uh, the ones that are not on fault lines, uh, are being generated by a, a magnetic pole peak. In other words, magnetic interaction is melting the rock and causing a volcano to exist. So, um, the, the the types of volcanoes, what form forms them? So. The hot spots under under Yellowstone and Hawaii and and other locations look like they might be the the magnetic peak where a lot of energy electromagnetic energy is being concentrated due to magnetism. So the the the, the issue you we have here is that we have different reasons for volcanoes to exist and we don't understand them all. And geology um, is ignoring the like cosmology is ignoring the the impact of electromagnetic discharge mechanisms and uh, not realizing the sort of power that's involved you know we talk about a, a coronal mass ejection a cme 
that is a fundamental rearrangement of magnetic um, structure in the sun that causes the, the a quantity of material that is staggeringly large to be just tossed away. Um, and, and, and compared to an electrical discharge, the magnetic events are, you know, all thousands of times more powerful in terms of total energy involved. We just, we don't understand these processes properly enough. Uh, there you go, Robert. We think we know and we, we don't. You put really things in this form, you put it into that form, and I will import it and make the map. You, you have at it with the supervolcanoes and calderas. And uh, we'll we'll make a map and we'll start seeing what uh, <laughs> I love it. People on the show are probably like, man, these guys are off the chain. Yeah, let's create solutions. So we'll get the uh, electro uh, geology side up uh, map up to date and we'll we'll do the super volcanoes and we'll just start overlaying. Uh, I can even in one map uh, actually in the same in the same electro geology map, I can just overlay it with a different color and we can start seeing what kind of patterns. Uh, so as, so long as it all goes into that. Uh, that template spreadsheet, it'll it'll be an easy import, very easy. Uh, well, it might be even easier because I'm pretty sure there's a global map of uh, volcanoes already existing. Uh, well, yeah, but we don't want to just get every volcano. Uh, we want to focus on ones that we have a very strong suspicion. Um, for example, the uh, Inyo caldera, um, I, Yellowstone maybe, but uh, well, I think anything that has to do with the, the, the hot spot plumes in the center of, of the plates is probably a suspect, whether or not it's, you know, it, it may not be actually um, electrically connected. We don't know because we haven't gone down there to see why in the heck it might be just a weak spot too, but it certainly is a suspect. And so we might as well, you know, include those too. And once we have about, you know, 500 data points, if patterns are going to emerge, then, then we'll start seeing them. Yeah, but the other thing you're going to find is if these sorts of volcanoes are, in fact, magnetically generated, as it were, we'd have to get in pretty close to see the really intense magnetic fields driving these things. Because I mean, take a neodymium magnet. It's not until you get relatively close to these things that they suddenly become real strong magnets. Um, so we're, you know, determining that these things are magnetic consequence, the, the things are a result of magnetic, um, peaks is, is going to require a, a different approach at scanning these volcanoes in the first place. But in, in Eastern Asia, the Western Pacific, the volcanoes that are on that side of the Pacific tend to be mud volcanoes. They're, they've got high water content and all the rest of it. So a lot of these islands, are, it's sort of like a coral coral offshoot of a hot environment around it. So you've got a mag, a, a, a mud volcano that you know life is, builds its coral around because you know it's resource rich as far as the little creatures that that live in that environment. It's a bit like the smokers, the deep sea smokers, same sort of thing. All right, so uh, what what features I, 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 am I uh, missing still on the list of uh, electrogeology? I've got the arches, the laser gang bands, the uh, Lichtenberg shapes, let's see, Kimberly pipes. What other things are we seeing? What about what about um, limestone cave networks like what's under Florida? Yeah, and and Kentucky. And is that is that the consequence of the electrogeology in process? Uh, possibly. There is, there is a strange. So when you go down uh, through Kentucky, I'll, I can speak a little to that briefly. So let's take it. Let's let's do a zoom in here. Um, this needs to get updated with the Hicks dome on it and everything like well, here's the Hicks dome. You can see you can see there's something strange happening here. Uh, the Garden of the Gods that where the Lee's gang banding is the most intense and look at how it follows right out of these gorges that have flowed across, which is called the land between the lakes and the flora spar deposits are the biggest ones in the world are in this region, right? uh right about i'm sorry right about here 
This is where the largest uh, fluorospar deposits in the entire world are. Okay, and then you have caves throughout the state, but they're most especially the, the famous ones are down here uh, in the uh, in this region where the arch the the uh, let's let's switch the satellite view here. Okay, very good. So you have your Lichten you have your Lichtenberg uh, knob regions where the the uh, altitude is about 900 feet throughout, except there are occasional sputtering discharge sites where the knob reaches a 1200 to 1400 foot. So down here in the Green River knob. And uh, the Green River is interesting because um, the mussels in it grow pearls and there's all these uh, um, connections to the ancient past and Terra Preta or Dark Earths. Um, but the, the arc up here into Louisville and uh, and then it goes around this this dome, this raised dome, which of course the thunderbolt, the Paradian thunderbolt, is in the center of the dome, because it was attack. It was obviously attracted. Uh, it's a single pulse, so it's not a long, you know, whatever formed uh, these <clears throat> larger shapes. I mean, you can see here uh, the arches. There's a tons. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of arches in this this. Uh, what do you call uh, kind of like a ley line that goes up from Ohio down through Kentucky and into Tennessee. And then you have these interesting square features in these ridge mountains over here. But anyways. So the question is, do the caves on this end of the ley line uh, reflect the behavior of the caves, the world's longest caves over here in Mammoth Cave. Now, when you go down this freeway, I-65, there is a, a feeling you get, which reminds me very greatly of both the Red River Gorge and of uh, places like Yosemite, uh, Olympic National Park in Washington. And it's a very strange thing, kind of an interesting uh, fact uh, the oldest TP motel uh, uh, is still extant and running is here in this area. It's sort of a Route 66 kind of feeling, this 31W. And, um, and in fact, it was the second of the TP motels that was uh, made. The original one there in the southwest is already gone, so this is the, the oldest one. And this whole area has a strange attraction of energy. But when you drive by, there are actually two cave systems that are huge. There's the Mammoth Cave System, which is the longest in the world. And over here is one called the, uh, oh yeah, you guys like this. This is Kentucky Down Under. They have uh, kangaroos, pretty funny. Um, over here, they have another one called the Fisher Ridge Cave System. It is the fourth longest in the world. And they are only separated from each other by, I think a matter of 300 feet. And so the question is, the, these structure, these uh, shapes, let's turn this to 3D. Um, when you're driving down the highway and you see these knobs pop up, they seem to just come right out of the ground. And the secret is that within them um, are these beautiful caves. Some of them are just long caves. They're definitely formed with, with water uh, flowing through. And then some of them, like the Crystal Onyx Cave, have tons of uh, features, you know, flow features. But there is a strange energy that is an inescapable, there's an inescapable feeling that these ones in particular uh, have been lifted up out of the ground and then something um, special happened with inside as if it was like a lab experiment. Now, that's not proof of anything. But it is interesting because there's so much electrogeology in the uh, can, in the Kentucky region. Very interesting thing too for the audience to know. This is the Great River, which is now called the Ohio. At one time after the the uh, Younger Dryas melt, it was the volume of the Amazon. It was a mega mega river. Another thing, the uh, New Madrid Fault that goes through this area over here is way more powerful than the San Andreas Fault. And when it last ruptured in a major way, the Mississippi River actually flowed backwards for a while. 
And so they've been expecting it to go for uh, quite a long time. So there's a lot of interesting geological connections here. A lot of people don't think about because it's the Midwest of the United States. But you can just see that there's something interesting has happened here. And it has nothing to do with two continents colliding. That's all that's all this stuff over here, this like bent up and everything. But you can see that something else has been going along here. And then, like I say, the raised dome uh, happens here. There's another uh, crypto explosion. Um, so there's two astral beams. There's one out here. Uh, there it is. Now you can see that this one was an oblique strike. Boom. And it has a bow shock to the right, to the east. And the other crypto explosion, the other bolide crypto explosion is the very famous um, where the Cumberland Gap is. The we've, we've gone over this before on the show, the Middlesboro crater where there's an actual city inside uh, and it blasted out the uh, the gap in the mountain uh, in this, this uh, band. So we've covered that and these might be Andy Hall uh, type structures. But then there's a, a hidden crypto explosion uh, event on the Fort Knox. And this is the Fort Knox of famous gold. Uh, and somewhere underneath this actual base, maybe the entire base is built over top of this dome. It, there is no geology studies on it, at least that have been published to the public. Uh, it is still a, to this day, a, uh, a secret base you can you can theoretically visit the General Patton Museum, but I mean, it's not like you could just go jogging around this base. And that's one of two, the more famous base as far as military um, these days is Fort Campbell. But that Fort Knox and the, the one where they hide the, uh, the mounds, the, the Matic mounds uh, over here, um, these are very important top secret installations. Um, they're not Area 51 level uh, important, but I mean, this one was important. They were storing VX gas and mustard and cyanide and everything here. And those mounds, if people want to uh, see, here they are. Here they are. They're shaped here. Boom, boom, boom. And then you got them again down here. And... Uh, I got all that that's all been done in paper before, but you could see where they purposely uh, changed the road pattern or to go around the mounds. They knew they were there. And they built it. I got to run to the restroom, fellas. I'll be right back. So they had a natural, so they had a natural place to store it all. Possibly. It's a bit like the, 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 the Janol and caves in, in New South Wales. This is, the, the geological structure in terms of things is similar. Yeah. There's a there's feathering and mechanisms and all the rest of it. So I'm I'm just wondering whether if you got a water course through the limestone and you have a, an electrical discharge, do you get uh, cavening occur where where they just get drilled out basically, and then over time due to erosion and and, and weathering, that the nature changes. Mm. But if you're looking at, 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 at some of the structures around, you know, the, 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 the Great Divide in Eastern Australia, you know, what sort of structures you get there. And then when you get to the Gambia region in South Australia, you've got uh, sinkholes and mm -hmm. water, water things that are down there, which looks like, you know, uh, quite amazing water, uh, quite amazing geological structure as well. But it's also a volcanic. You know, so when you look at when you look at what Ramon was saying and, and you and you too, with your desertification and your thunderbolts, right? You'd have to say that the power of them takes all the organic material, well, virtually just... everything everything in that soil or that that's area is 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 killed. Yep, your little microbes, everything. I think so it must be, it must be like over a period, you know, of time. And like I've said to people, how do you know we're still not getting that electrical charge, just not as severe in places? 
Well, so it would take until you until you rebuilt up until that <laughs> those areas rebuilt up the the mass for all the mitochondria and all that to really start living and get the water holding abilities and that it will stay a desert and that can take a long time by the look of it. I think some of these lightning bolts that we're talking about, these thunderbolts, are actually effect equivalent to a, a particle beam. And, um, yeah. And particle beam will sterilize at quite a large yeah. area. It's, and, but it's more than that. You know, you've got, a, a, you've got a, an, an electrical discharge or electromagnetic discharge, which is, which is turning the ground into dust, sucking it up into a vorticing mechanism turning it into sand, basically, you know, void of any life, and it's just dumped on the ground afterwards. And, you know, if you get um, kilometres or miles of, uh, of sand just dumped somewhere, it doesn't really matter whether there was, a, whether there was any, anything like a forest or anything like that underneath. It's, you know... No, it's gone. <laughs> a mile of sand will, will turn any area into a desert without too much trouble. The question is, is where did the sand come from? Uh, you know, if you look, at, you're looking at these regions. There's a lot of sand, and it didn't come from the bottom of the ocean. That's for sure, because that's oh. not what, that's not what's at the bottom of the ocean. So where did the sand come from? Did it come from the the mass, the solar mass ejection mechanism that's occurred? Did it rain out of the sky, courtesy of being dumped on the planet by the sun? Because in the transition, you know, we don't really know what's in the in that material that's being dumped spat in the space from the sun you know what's the silica content of it and all the rest of it and it's it, these things take you know the better part of a few days to arrive at, at the orbit of the earth and if if enough material is being spat out to darken the sun for three days which is what the record the, the, the mythology talks about that's a lot of material you know, three mm -hmm. days of from a solar mass ejection you know, it's a huge, huge quantity of material. It's got a, if it intercepts a planet anywhere along, it's going to get dumped on. There's no doubt about that at all. We're going to take this up to another, another level here. This is from the day that we did the, the most recent survey that, like I say, unfortunately, my good friend Bruce Grimes has since passed away. He was the primary contact over there, although I could, I could obviously I, I, I remember how to get to the, the site and everything, but because I've been there a couple of times. So these plant these plants, according to a geologist, are, are natural to the, the spot. They could have been, in my mind, exposed um, by the, the natives. This knob has is shorter than the other knobs that surround it. What's the scale on that? Uh here you're about you're about to see so we hired uh the ancient kentucky we hired a drone uh, guy so here's the drones like taking off you know so you can see the these, these trees and whatnot you can see the height of the knob uh, surrounding so the geologist's idea and i i know him personally is that this was denuded and exposed some think that these plants were laid there um i think that it's possible that they were exposed and then shaped in the bosnian uh, pyramid kind of style but here to do the cosmic shamash um, well, what, unfortunately the site has been terribly just denuded and destroyed you can see here by the where the trucks people have been pulling up and taking stones um and they literally told us they're very open about it they, they don't they don't mind to tell you uh, so at any rate, so here the, the drone is flying that you can see me and my kids there and there's there's my truck in the back. Um, and this was just this year in June. It's a nice hot day. So this prof this is a guy is a professional drone. You can see his, his information there. Isaac Cooper He is a professional drone flyer. Uh, he does this for a living. He is uh, he does airport surveys and power lines. He has no problems anywhere whatsoever okay and i want to emphasize that this is the region that we were just looking at uh right in around here so this is in this these these lichtenberg type type of knobs 
I'd have to do a second to try and it'd take me a second to figure out exactly where it is. Let's see if we have but that rock one. formation. You know, if you if you didn't know what the scale was, it's looking you know the, like the remains of a village or city, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah, well, that's what we were hoping it was. It was a stone fort at first. Now it's looking more likely to be uh, uh, a, a shamash uh, thing. So anyways, so this is in that Lichtenberg uh, formation and it's flying along. Let's skip a little head here. Doesn't my truck look great? <laughs> how, flat, how flat is that structure? It's pretty flat. Not it's not supposed to be. So but the question is, this is a steep is a hill. This is I, I used four wheel drive to get up here. It's it's pretty yeah, steep. So but then when you're on top of it, it's flat. So the question I've got is, was there a stone building? Is that the floor of a stone building? There's no there's no evidence of any. There's no other markings or anything that isn't in the historic period. So we can't find any evidence for anything beyond my surmise that this dr ratio that you're seeing matches the 1.23 that we see in the egyptian records and uh, by the way i i, I produced a, a uh, prediction in the uncharted x channel they were showing raw okay boom did you see that so you saw how it ended like that that ending that ending was not on purpose we were sending him to go look at a at a uh, another uh, knob, and the drone was EM pulsed, and it barely limped back to him. He's never had that happen before. It was flying at at uh, four hundred foot elevation. So somebody it tapped it, or, or it suffered in that. No, nope. the knob was active electrically. It was producing a field. Now the question. Why is why would it be producing a field? And I reckon it has to do with the changes in the sun. That look that that structure looks awfully triangular to me. Yeah, you got well, uh, orthogonal. Uh, I have a paper on it. If you if you decide to get interested in, in the Calder Town platform, yeah. like I say, they are. That's called the. Uh, uh, it's a type of sandstone called the uh, uh, float stone, but. Uh, What's interesting is there's there's little like iron rivulets throughout it that indicate to me that this site was probably excavated uh, by the Thunderbolt and then they turned it into a site where they did worship uh, for the sun, the the old the old sun Shamash is what it seems to be indicating. What I was saying about the the Egyptian statue of Ra, somebody was asking, well, what what's that disc above his head? I said, well, I'm predicting that that is a ratio of 1.23, and that's exactly what it was. Unfortunately, the people in the Uncharted X community didn't know how to take me. <laughs> so um, we're at the point now where electrogeology and the cosmology uh, are running into you know, running into one another, which is good because cosmogony should flow from the cosmology. And the cosmology should reflect an excellent cosmogony, which you cannot get with with a standard model because their cosmogony is not related at all to the Big Bang. I mean, they, they're they're claiming that gold is on the planet because some supernova happened such, such and such a time, however many billions of years ago. But they're not telling you why it flows in rivulets or why it collects in certain areas. According to that theory, it should just all kind of spray the entire the entire solar system evenly but there is not an even amount of gold in the uh, in, in the, the solar system period what happens if the, the 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 metals that we claim are valuable on the surface of the earth rained out of our, our own ionosphere as it's they, being well, in, have. In, the by, chinese the chinese have a curiosity where the word for metal and the word for gold are the same and then they have a belief in alchemy that uh, the gold comes from metal that has set under the sun so long that it transmuted into gold and was imbued with the energy of the gold. And when you look at the, uh, the periodic table, it's not necessarily impossible for that to be actually true. According to, of course, 
structured atomic model theory. That's the that's and the key. There. Our understanding of how that works, the periodic table and all the rest of it's a bit wonky. Yeah. Um, but um, we know fusion results are occurring through electrical discharge mechanisms. Iron is supposed to be the, the point where fusion stops, but I, <laughs> I can't agree with that. No, no, that didn't make any sense. And um, if, we, if we properly look at a Farnsworth nuclear generator, you have a Farnsworth um, device, if we control the electrical and uh, gas inputs correctly, we should be able to produce um, quantities of whatever element we desire. What we haven't figured out is how that process actually works. You know, the standard nuclear talks about uh, construction chains, but um, I was doing some analysis and uh, some of our elements are actually, if we go and get two oxygen atoms and convince them to be part of each other, you'll get silicon if we add a couple of hydrogens. So the actual way elements are built in reality versus what the theory is, the two do not agree. And I have a preference to agree that from the from the SAN, SAM model of atomic construction, that elements appear to actually be a living growing structure. In other words, they will they will grow in a crystalline manner. Uh, and and our current theory about how this actually works is not correct. And I know this sort of stuff may well be true because of some anecdotal evidence where a problem was being experienced and and metals in circuitry were suffering transition due to high magnetic field structures. So here here you asked about the that platform. Here's the LIDAR of the platform. You can see that it's not so much triangular that it, that the actual shape is rather cosmic egg. Um, yeah. It's very steep uh, on the approach and then it's obvious that the top has been cleared. Um, interestingly enough, there's an iron furnace nearby, so there are sources of iron. This is what the site looks like. This is the first survey we had done. How level it is. We actually uh, did some some uh, civil engineering type surveying. And um, yeah, this is unusual, but not unheard of uh, in Kentucky. There are numerous sites and Bruce was unfortunately the person responsible for a lot of those kinds. So now these little these little fingers are not carvings. These are the where the veins of iron. This, this really strange iron um, minerals, these iron ore veins, which feel honestly um, equivalent to like a, a form of heavy, heavy pottery. That's the way they feel in your hand. And uh, that's just looking off. You can see that we're, we're lower than the surrounding knobs as if it's been again denuded. This is the only inscription that we could find. This is historic. It obviously says Jack. And here's the physical survey that that uh, I did. We looked at the uh, E field and the B field, and the really the only thing we found was under one one of the plinths there was uh, some interesting activity happening. And the conclusions from the geologists was that it was uh, was natural, and I don't agree, uh, disagree with that. But I think that the reason why they chose this, the, why the natives would have chosen the spot, uh, uh, would have to do with that. Uh, it being natural, but then being electrically affected. Yeah, but you know, when we went back, process, the process uh, we're talking about are natural processes. So you know. They happen in nature, so therefore they're natural. Right. Now, uh, this, this, so this no understanding here. of natural processes. Um, 
These are the Lisa Gang bands and things that I was talking about. Some of the unique features that show clear uh, like polarization. Uh, that is not what I was looking for. Though, so. Oh, I was. This is the paper I was looking for. Close. Uh, close those two. Okay, so then we went back, and of course you saw the video footage that we did. And here was the the other um, site. Interestingly enough, twelve hundred meters uh, away, which is the same diameter as the Durrington uh, the Durrington wall structure with the, the the pits, which they're claiming are man made, which are clearly not man made, but man maintained, which is hilarious that archaeologists can't tell the difference. But at any rate. Uh, so there's no proof, though, that, that 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 this distance is necessarily related. But like I say, when we started flying the, the drone over towards this site, it became zapped. And then this is an example of what those veins look like. Very interestingly, it, it almost had like a hinge hinge like behavior. Um, and I don't know if that's because it was under the sun for some amount of time. But like I say, this is one of those veins, and then it, it you would push on this end and it would split on this on the other end. And that's where the research stood as of as of June for that location. It's an archaeological location uh, and or geological. Well, it's historically uh, significant too, uh, in terms of archaeology, but uh, there's no proof that necessarily anyone lived on it. Um, the family, the, the family that's owned it for the last hundred plus years, they have always treated it as if it was an Indian burial ground, except people would occasionally come up and steal stones. And in fact, between the two surveys, uh, I guess they took the news that it was, um, you know, not a stone fort and decided to start using the stones. One of the guys said that that. Uh, um, they had dropped a stone and had like broken a foot or something, so they got scared and brought it all back. So superstition was what was protecting the site for all this time. Interesting. Well, that's, part of the, that's part of the statements about Uluru, Ayers Rock, is that people have been, you know, grabbing little bits of it and then sending it back after bad luck or, you know, unfortunate events. You know, and they've been returning the, the stuff they've taken because of... <laughs> Superstition. But the question is, is it really superstition? Are they, you know, suffering some sort of cosmic karma for what they've done? Who knows? And then Ganung Padang has the same thing. Part of, I mean, a lot of it was politics, why they stopped the, the excavation at Ganung Padang. But there is also the people have a lot of stories about Ganung Padang and they're afraid. They're afraid. They're they may possibly legitimately afraid. Um, but bear in mind, look at how close, look at how close to these knobs. Of course, the big Lichtenberg that is the center of the of the affair is definitely this this site right here. Uh, it's flat and it's, uh, you know, all of the electricity is radiating out from from this area. But look how close the mammoth caves uh, and basically caves are throughout. So here was the other thing I was going to show. So I'm going to go to the hidden Kentucky map, and uh, we're going to we're going to notice some uh, something very interesting, because this is the area that's known as Cave Country, right? Um, and and it's it's obviously going to be a karst topography. So you can see much better on this map. You can see the Lichtenberg very very clearly. Okay. But what they don't tell you is that there's caves throughout all of that. There's caves throughout the uh, Daniel Boone ley line all throughout here. In fact, there's a very his important historical cave here called the Great Saltpeter Cave. It has a, a carbon soot uh, writing from the 1700s in this cave. They only open it once a year to the public. And That's where the all the... Um all the material that was being, it was a storehouse during the Civil War, wasn't it? For, That's correct. Uh, getting saltpeter for the Civil War, for the, for the powder. So all of this, all of this ridge, all of this right around here is all uh, caves. 
And so the, it begs the question, how much of these, how much of these, uh, of this electrical ley line is full of caves? And there's different kinds of caves, sand caves and the limestone caves. And then, like I say, you have the mammoth caves over here. And we, we talked about that. And we talked about the Fisher, the Fisher Ridge uh, caves nearby. Okay, but now check this out. And nobody talks about this except for, uh, I assume, some obscure geologists. And this is a lot like the site you were showing us uh, or having me show us in the... Uh, what do you what do you call that in the Kimberley or something? I can't remember the name of that that national park that you were talking about. Car Oh, let's see. I gotta find big tourist site. You know, big gorge. It's you know, equivalent. It's not as big as the Grand Canyon, but it's pretty spectacular because you've got layered iron beds throughout the entire structure. So, hold on, I've gone too far west uh, but there is here's some interesting uh all of these uh floor spar mines that they're, they're all throughout this area and look look at the look at the geology changes suddenly interesting something to explore later marion is a town of uh, amish people with a there's a famous uh gym uh, a uh, lar very large gym museum there and they have a bunch of floor spar and look what's nearby the hicks dome and you can yeah. see that it blasted, but there's a there just like the Melbourne explosion. There's something electrical happened here in the in the Garden of the Gods because I've got rocks showing the the polarization, but something must have physically struck because there's a bow shock. And well, they're trying to, they're trying to claim that that's volcanic. By the way, it's hilarious. There's no gravity anomalies. There's only magnetic anomalies. But they're trying where's, to claim where's the where's the, uh, the 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 lava dike that's supposed to be the right, but, right, uh, right, exactly. The, the, the Janolan Caves, to the west of the Janolan Caves in New South Wales, there's a gem field. Oh. And the, the, the gem field you were describing here in, in Amish country, the question I have is, is that to the west of, of this cave structure? Yeah, it is. And, and, and I'm trying to, sh I'm trying to I'm find just wondering that. Whether that phenomena is a global one, you know, where you have these caves to the west of them. Is there a gem field? I'm not. Maybe so. Here it is. Here it is. Look at that. And then what I just tell you is, oh, it's it's a karst. It's 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 because it's karst. It's all it's all limestone. So according to their theory, each one of these is is uh, got a cave underneath, and that's probably true. But now it the looks like state, it looks like divots though. The entire state is limestone. Okay, so there's caves. There's lots of caves here in Lexington. There were mummies in these caves in Lexington. But Lexington does not look like this. What's to the to the north of all? No, well, the there. river, the river is oh, to but that more, circular structure to the, on the river. Uh, that's just where the river winds around. With a raised dome in the middle. Yeah, the, the, that that happens a lot. The, the river will change directions. This is probably with the Buck Creek itself. Probably came in and then actually went around it and then came down. That happens a lot in this in this region. We have tons of those kinds of, of structures. Happens all the time. Here's here's another very similar. We get them along all sorts of creeks. But uh, look at look at how I mean there is this pock marking, and here's more caves. Interesting that you're you're mentioning this on the the west side here of these pock marks. I mean, but they're it, they're just everywhere. And yet, uh, again, if it has to do with it being limestone in a flat region, well, here's a big question. In the proper katiki, why don't we see that everywhere? I mean, we do see some because it, the whole state is karst. Okay, but this, this very, very, it's very obvious that there's some kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say peppering or <laughs> Something strange happening in this this field is just tons. And like I say, not far from here, here's that here's that crypto explosive site. Is is on, here's Fort Knox. And again, there is a strange energy at Fort Knox. It's very odd, very very unusual. I'm just wondering whether the limestone beds is where the, after the material above it was removed and then uh, spread around into ridges around the, whether the, it's 
the, the mainstream the theology wants you to wants you to believe that all this was caused by uplift, including this this knob that is all out by its lonesome. Uh, for some well, reason, more more, whether... more uplifted than this this one here. I'm just wondering if it's 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 the material left behind after everything above it was scraped away with electric machining. And then this because of the machining mechanism, limestone being a calcium based metal is being uh, stone is uh, being dragged up due to the electromagnetic forces above it. That that would be what I would assume. Is. And and then 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 the material is being dumped around in ridges due to electrical deposition mechanisms because it looks awful like water flow doesn't it in reverse now, here's here's another here's another strange little thing we'll, we'll leave this as the third so the the we've covered this before in the previous uh cast there is a harmonics of of uh heightened energy and activity as you go along this this ley line right so this ley line more or less begins in this area it goes up and there's a height here and then there's a height here uh there's a really tall uh mountain called wildcat mountain where there's some civil war stuff and then there's another peak of energy here in the red river gorge and then um interestingly enough where the other arthurian stuff connects there is a very strange thing happening this area, which is where I'm looking to buy um, land up here, this area uh, has uh, a confluence of three or four different kinds of regions. Number one, it has this Olympic. And the Olympic, you could see it, it, the, the uh, geology is kind of different. And, and, and then you have what is called the highlands. Uh, and the highlands look like this. They look kind of like uh, Wisconsin Dells. And then you have this, this uh, Daniel Boone ley line in which you get these kind of interesting ridges and a lot of gorges. And guess what happens in this region um, where obviously also the rivers are flowing through? Guess what interesting thing happens? The, the amount of rainfall re-increases again because it's it's there's more rainfall down here as you get down towards Tennessee and that's normal because there's a and down in Tennessee there's a uh, very famous uh this here is called the uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park it is a temperate rainforest right because of the height of the mountains etc it's where Old Smoky, when people sing the song on top of Old Smoky, all covered in blood. That's 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 the tallest mountain in the Appalachian chain is Clingman's Dome. That's Old Smoky. Okay, but then there's a, a sort of temperate, uh, almost rainforest down here in the south. That's normal because of the mountains. But then there's a peak, and then there's more rainfall up here than anywhere else in the state at this confluence and it's not particularly because of the height of the mountains they're not they're not they're they're certainly not taller than the ones that are down here well that my my claim is that, that all weather events are electromagnetic in nature right so right. if you've got if you've got uh electric and magnetic field anomalies then water will concentrate in the negative areas and disappear from the positive areas it may interest you to, to note so here's the olympic itself so if you were to sit down there and look at look at the magnetic arrangement where you have a magnetic south in the south well, in the, i don't know whether it's the case in the northern hemisphere but anyway if the magnetic south uh, um rise in in where the south south field is higher than the north field you'll get a drier environment whereas if it's a north intense field you'll get a wetter environment so around the area where i live there we know there's a south magnetic anomaly about a uh, hundred kilometers away and if you watch the weather pattern over the town i live in it's always got a low pressure system developing across the top of the town and that it never hardly ever rains here 
And then when we watch the low as it moves, it goes into Victoria, cross, crosses the continent in three days, and all the water that gets sucked up here ends up getting dropped all over Victoria and New, New South New South Wales. So right. I'm just wondering whether whether what the magnetic polarity features of these regions are. Are they promoting a dry and wet spots due to the field environment? And if they did the LIDAR with the magnetometer, that would be pretty handy because then they would have mapped out the entire state for us at the same time. We could have had an overlay. But interesting to our to our uh, hypothesis again, the entire knobs region. All right, so this is the knobs region over here, right? The 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 ley line is on this side where you can see the red uh, shelter we tra uh, trace trail going through. The the knobs are down uh, along here along this this area that I'm I'm trying to highlight. And then you have the highlands. Well, the knobs are not supposed to generally uh, exceed about 900 feet on average, but suddenly. Um, is this anode what looks like it could be a pilot knob type anode that's 1100 feet and the same thing happens um let's see where it is it would be doo, doo, doo. the famous pilot knob that daniel boone himself stood on um it suddenly rises up to a, a height i guess i have it on here do i have it on here that's all it is i don't have it on here but if, if I remember correctly, it's it, it itself is about 1,100 feet. And it's suddenly very much, much steeper. It might be even up to 1,400 feet. And then we have a couple of pilot knobs, and then they look just like the pilot knob in North Carolina. Um, so th there's a large-ish kind of... Uh, uh, one long mountain down here called Zion Mountain. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things I could say about Zion Mountain. But then look at this. And I almost bought this one. Now, the Indian fort where, they, uh, where the Matic people actually built their, their forts is itself uh, quite Lichtenberg-like. And there's a lot of energy. People love hiking here. And the head of the dragon is here, the typical head of the, of the dragon. And it has the slate. It's a slayed dragon, so it has the broken neck. So the energy here flows towards that that point, uh, just like the Chinese say. And look at it; it's right next to, so it could be acting as the cathode. This pilot knob, and I almost did purchase this Dagon thing. And it rises well over; uh, it's look at like almost thirteen hundred feet here, which is unusual again for these um, these average. The average height of these knobs is nine hundred feet. And the Green River knob does the same thing, 1,400 feet. Again, behaving as anodes, in, in my opinion. So those are not Paradian features, right? That Paradian features are generated by induction in the plasma sphere. This is, to my mind, has to be arc connection. Well, there's a lot of electrical feathering structure being generated. Correct. The rivers and and the rivers and the high areas are a mirror of each other um, or an inversion of each other. So that that indicates that if you've got an electrical discharge across large large areas, you get the the feathering effect because of it, it's being spread across a a, a wide geological um, surface. And, and these are not these water, are not water so rich ones. These are, these are from the Shamash era because this river here, the Kentucky River, is known as the second oldest riverbed in the world. And it cuts right through the middle of this uh, Lichtenberg as if the, the I mean, the, um, the ley line, as if the whole thing was raised up around the river. Because the river begins way out, you could see it begins way in here. The Kentucky River is a, 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 a when you count all the branches of it, it's a very very long river, and it's very very old. the The stone is estimated it's from the um, Denisovan period. But that 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 structure is very similar to the south to the area around. Um 
south New South Wales end of the Divide Range. You get the very similar um, gorging structure, but it, yeah. it also occurs in Europe and, and Africa and elsewhere. So if we're talking about a period of significant discharge, a lot of this feature could have, a lot of this structure could have been, you know, created globally in a very short period of time at approximately the same time. No good. Maybe, maybe or within a hundred or a couple of, couple of hundred could years. Have, it could have been in continuous uh, behavior. We, I mean, we have no idea, but there's, but there seems to be evidence for lots of different kinds of ar uh, electrogeology happening here. And I'm not saying that, that nobody's talked about that in the Thunderbolts group, but we have seen from Yelverton, Yelverton's and Gable's uh, videos that it's quite possible to create lots of different kinds of electrogeology. And I think that it's, it's high time that we start noticing all that and talking about it. Um, one of my well, interesting... Go ahead. I think the Rocky Mountains and the Himalayas, the, the, the western edge of the Americas and the Himalayas themselves are actually an electromagnetic deposition mechanism. In Very other well, words, the, the mountains were built from above, not from below. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem rather unusual for them to make the claim that the high, I mean, and a, a lot of the highest, obviously, are the Sierras. And these could be, maybe they are uplift. But when you when you actually drive through them, it's very obvious that the tallest uh, mountains that you're encountering they're happening on the eastern edge. Now, yes. why why would that be happening? It, 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 if the plate's crashing over here, then why is it buckling to great heights on the on the eastern end? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you have all of that in between, and also when you have one of the world's lowest points in the entire world right here. In Death Valley. And in fact, it's getting it's getting it will be eventually the lowest point and it's going to to get so thin that they reckon that it will actually the crust will split and we and, and, and whoever is alive at that point in however many millions of years, they'll actually be able to see the mantle. And well, so why would, also why would it be continuously the, the like valley. that? Huh? That same claim is being made of the Rift Valley in Ethiopia, but the Rift Valley runs right. from the, the Sea of Galilee in, in the Middle East all the way down to, what, halfway down the, Africa, if not all the way to the bottom? It, yeah, but the, the difference there is that that is pulling apart. Here, um, the plate is supposed to be moving northwest uh, over here, not over by the, the, the Death Valley. Now, one of those calderas is uh, is here at this uh, levining, this this Inyo. Uh, here's Mona Lake. This is a very volcanically uh, active area. Um, the, then you have the Ma Mammoth Lakes, and then you come down and you, you go into the Inyo, and this, this caldera is currently not active, but... Uh, you know you can't uh, you can't help but escape when you when you drive down this 395 there is a very very there's something really interesting going on there and it's uh, and just 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 over here is mount whitney this is the tallest point in the contiguous 48 states of the united states and then you go just just a little east look at this within the screen and you have the one of the world's lowest places in the entire world so something very interesting. And you have the world's largest trees at Sequoia National Park. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. And like I say, there's a caldera. There's a giant caldera here. There is a very, very famous lake. This Mona Lake is, is electrically active. It is. Uh, it has no uh, rivers that inlet to it. Uh, and then you have, of course, the famous Yosemite. And you have a volcano that's ready to pop off any time, just like Mount St. Helens. Um, uh, at uh, Mammoth Mountain, and all this is happening in a very, uh, and they still have the hot springs, of course, in, in a very small area, relatively speaking. And uh, to, to my mind, a lot of that makes the most sense under Andy's theory. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Why? Why should most of the world not be full of all sorts of geological activity? 
if the mantle is underneath all of the crust, uh, shouldn't there be, according to their theory, activity happening almost everywhere? But there seem uh -huh. to be particular hot spots. The, the theory that I put forward that's you know, that they've taken a look at is that what the continent, there's a, a shell mechanism that's due to a nuclear process where light elements are turned into heavier ones. And in the process of doing that, you get a crystalline shell. Now, initially, that shell would have been, you know, relatively all the way around the planet. But due to the um, the events that have occurred in the past, it gets fractured and broken up. And the continents are above a relatively intact shell. So it's on the edges of that shelling mechanism you get volcanic behavior like volcanoes and, and rift valleys and Mariana Trench type structure. But um, the more broken up that shell is, the more or fractured, I should say, the 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 more you're going to get these um, uh, geological intrusions in the form of volcanoes and, and lava flows and water flows and all the rest of it. But right. where the shell is is uh, more intact, I suppose, these these features won't develop because they've got to penetrate through the shell. And we know that um, if you drill down far enough, you hit a layer and the Russians did it with their big deep shaft they built. They went down to a point where they hit a, a structure that they, their drills would break on. They couldn't actually get through it. And they were talking of doing, you know, let's 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 detonate a nuke and see what whether we can crack our way through. So there's a and on that theory, of course, you get the film called The Crack in the Earth, where that the 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 idea. I don't know whether my idea came from that film or not, but it's the same thing. This guy has has his nuclear thermonuclear missile pointing down the shaft and he reckons it's going to be like putting a pot a red hot poker through the glass and it'll just burn a hole but um he's the 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 hero of the story is saying well it's going to be more like this you hit it with a hammer and the whole thing just shatters and you've got a whole heap of trouble so the, the issues here these these ideas are not new you know it's like i don't know when the crack in the earth was actually filmed, but we're going back into the early 60s or late 50s for that film. So the question you've got to ask is, you know, what was the thinking back then? There's but certainly a lot more imaginative than is the case these days. They say, oh, our imaginations can't tolerate this, these ideas being correct, so we'll just say that they can't happen. Do that. You can watch it on Amazon or on YouTube for $2.99. Yeah. So, you know, that film is is an interesting idea about, you know, geological possibilities. And I, I don't know what the geology fraternity would be saying about it, but um, how would you prove that the film was based on bullshit? Look here, When Worlds Collide, 1951, and The Day the Earth Caught Fire. So here's a couple of science sci-fis for people to... to yeah. uh, the, the day the Earth caught fire is in relation to those uh, ionic detonations of nuclear weapons yeah, up in the ionosphere. Mm hmm Yeah. And, you know, you want to be scared, you know. The day the Earth caught fire is pretty worrying. And it didn't end well. It wasn't, you know, like at the end shot of the crack of the Earth where the little chipmunk comes out of the world and out of the dirt and you can, life goes on. Well, it, it looks like uh, looks like I've got some uh, something other than Netflix to watch uh, tomorrow for my uh, my day off. Uh, so I want to end the the show uh, with this. Um, we'll try and get through it in relatively succinct fashion. Uh, you you have some strong feelings about uh, their proposition, and uh, me, I have my response to the article put out by SciTech Daily. Uh, for people who aren't aware, it's uh, this article here. When you click and you go, it's a clever physics experiment that produces something from nothing. Yeah, and they proceed, in short, in short, they proceed to to claim that they that they've actually already done it and produce light from nothing, and they're ready to go and prove that they've already got the answer, even though they've they've not done anything. 
Um, so my my response, and I'll just summarize it this way because there's already a paper and you don't need to hear more about me is, uh, first of all, you, you can't produce something from nothing, that there must be uh, some kind of source. Uh, then I, I, I step through and as per usual in Dark Matter series, uh, which this is not a Dark Universe paper, but... Uh, but but you know it's it's in the realm of pseudoscience kind of uh, area, so we put it in the dark in the dark matter series. Uh, you'll be able to find that here. You go to the lower left here, so it's the newest. And all the newest papers are highlighted green, and so I, I step through and and I put numbers to things, and then I I put my responses to them, and. Um, you know, I, t I briefly talk about the black hole theory and the problem with the black hole theory because they decided to just include that for no apparent reason in the experiment. They really did not need to go into black holes, Einstein, uh, Newton, um, or anything else, but just talk about, just stick to the thermodynamics. But for some reason, the article brought all those things in, almost as if they needed to convince people that it's all one uh, co uh, contiguous cosmology, and it's just not. And so uh, that gave me the opportunity also to add uh, one more new falsification to the table. Uh, so this table is now continuously being updated. So there's a new falsification for dark energy uh, that's been added in here. I'm sure there's other falsifications that have happened uh, for all these other things. However, uh, I didn't update those. And I step through and and uh, debunk various uh, aspects and clarify things uh, such as lasing uh, uh, and uh, structured light, etc. And yeah, so by the end of it, you know, it's still under edit, so it'll it'll you know we, we've got hundreds of uh, citations, so it'll have plenty of of information there. I will be sending it to the authors at Dartmouth at Mar Dartmouth College. And uh, and getting their response, which we may get no response as per usual. So I thought I'd give Robert a chance to talk about his nature of things and for us to maybe debate uh, the concepts of space, counter space, ether, zero point, and whatnot. And maybe uh, maybe Andy'd like to also uh, chime in. Uh, whoever wants to take it away. I'll have a go. Um, the ether, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about a structure that is the building block of all matter. And in the speculation I'm developing, we've actually come up with a, a quantity construction model where the aether particles group together and produce light photons. And we're not sure about how the mechanism occurs, but what we think is there's a, a null energy condition that occurs. In other words, the the charge environment is so cancelled that the that, that the uh, aether responds by creating matter to get rid of the null environment, and um, the the amount of energy that's available to do that is effectively infinite. So, the goal of the universe is to get rid of the null environment and 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 cause the 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 highly chaotic motion, and. Um, in unitary terms, we're talking about um, photons being created in, in 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 a flash mechanism. So these events will produce I don't know how many, but quite a large number of photons in a go. So you'll get a flash event. So this creation of something from nothing is a total violation of of, of the conservation of matter. You cannot create matter from nothing. It is one of the tenets of physics. Um, and I'm saying that we need to be careful with our laws of uh, thermodynamics because they apply to closed systems. And um, we don't have enough of our system to know whether it's closed or not. So this creation from nothing is just total logic nonsense and it's not supported by, by physics in any way, shape or form because it's, you're not allowed to create matter from nothing. Energy and matter are, not, are just transformed one from the other. But you cannot create energy. You cannot create matter from nothing. So the the, the whole premise of the paper is total crap. So you know, well, they're 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 not necessarily claiming that it's actually nothing. Uh, they just well, don't. Just to use those words in the paper. If that's not what they're claiming, that's, then they just. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's irresponsible of SciTech Daily to allow because I would assume that Dartmouth College 
type this up and then pass it to SciTech Daily uh, for a little bit of, you know, proto science, marketing, propaganda, touch up for, you know, making it clickbaity and helping it to get out there. Um, well, obviously, it worked. Obvious, obviously, it works algorithmically because it came across me and somebody else said, oh, yeah, I saw that paper. And I was like, well, you know, there's a lot of problems in it. And then they start introducing black holes. And so I had to busy spend some time debunking black holes again. And it just uh, it really is, is so problematic. Um, I want to draw people's attention to that Robert Decenti on Decenti.com. He has a whole series of ethereal mechanics, which will interest people because he has structure to uh, what he's just, just deciding. And apparently he has an entire electric ether uh, playlist. So 13 or so videos, you can see that he, he has, he, he labels his videos as if they're all part of a course. So he has a number of uh, electro, another uh, EMV videos here. And then he has some from his, uh, uh, UQ series. Uh, so uh, interesting. He has a he has an interesting take on all of these things, and he calls them ethons. Uh, and and there's this other called pretons, and I don't honestly know the difference between the two, um, but uh, may it may interest people to know. And the other was uh, I wanted to introduce people to the uh, professor male. Um, you know, he's into the concept of scalar magnetic waves, but more interestingly, he has a theory about how the um, core of the Earth may be trapping neutrinos, causing the uh, core to heat up and leading to these hot spots and buckling in the in the crust and leading to the therefore the, the potential liquefaction of the uh, crust and then subsequent when the when these plumes of neutrinos stop arriving from say some supernova or the filament electric filament then suddenly there's nothing supporting the plume so then the crust collapses and i think it's an interesting theory because he's produced a device that is, utilizes tesla turbines i'm sorry tesla coils to transfer information specifically uh, so he'll put he'll put uh, medicine like chemotherapy or something on the one Tesla coil, and then the person will be on a different Tesla coil in his machine. He will transfer the information from the um, chemotherapy or whatever medicine it is, the plant, whatever it is. And he will transfer it to the person so that they do not have to physically take it. And he has sold this device to many professionals. Uh, in the past, so uh, Professor Mail is uh, he's an interesting well, it's, character. It's the electromagnetic equivalent of homeopathy and uh, water memory. Correct. Uh, so, and and so if people want direct links to some of those, um, if you go to my Chi and Scalar Magnetic Waves paper here, um, it it's not a very this is not an EPMC paper because it was written before that standard was created. However, I do cover a lot of really great things, such as the right hand rule, uh, magnetic fields. I cover uh, the the magnetic fields in DNA. Um, I, I cover uh, the spectrum, and uh, and then at the end of the video, at the end of the paper, I do have a link to about six or so. Um, these are all just diagrams that are, you know, of interest to people who are in the field of, of, uh, you know, Chinese medicine or yoga. Where is it? At the end of the paper, yeah, there's a series of of uh, videos that you can click on that are all uh, Professor Mail, and hopefully, hopefully they're still up. Um, so those are two ether people. Obviously, Ken Wheeler's got his thoughts. Here, here's uh, more research on Kundalini. Um, so describe what? your your ether uh, well, dynamics and nature of things. What what I what I would say the aether that I I'm I'm saying there is an aether. Don't don't anybody doubt that at all. Um, it's not made up of neutrinos because uh, the speculation I have says that they're high energy photons. So they're a light structure, not a not a building block structure. Um, but in, in my model, we're talking about a triquateria trifoil, a tetrahedral simplex structure, 
that has some sort of energy flow mechanism. So that if you look at trifoils with rings and things like that, that's the image you would see if you could actually see these things. Um, they're a seed particle you know, that, that can expand from the infinitely small effectively to the infinitely large. So, you know, they could be larger than galactic structure and smaller than whatever you care to imagine. But in an energy null environment, these things clump together. You know, it's like dust particles in a, around a, a charged Van de Graaff ball. The, the dust will just collect on the surface. Uh, it's that sort of a mechanism. But the dust that we're talking about here is the actual charge in those structures. And these things build, therefore, into higher conglomerations, uh, into things that form the photon and, in, and the electron and proton structures. So it's a, it, it, it effectively is a growth, you know, they grow like life grows type structures. Um, but in the end, the, the, the thing is that this sea of environment is so dynamic, you, it's like looking at a, a flat ocean and thinking nothing's going on. But the thing is, there's so much motion in that ocean that you can't see any motion. If you were to sit in there and look in any direction, all you'd see is a chaos of movement and you couldn't figure out where you are just based on the environment around you. It's that dynamic. But it's being driven by charge, charge mechanisms inside the environment where you get a potential difference occurs. There's a discharge and, and, the, and the environment just sort of pulsates, as it were. But these structures are so small, their fields the field geometry of it is so constricted that one of these particles can go from any location in the universe to another location in the universe at any distance instantly. And the reason why it does that is its electromagnetic field structure is not big enough to interact with the environment generally. So it's just like slides past the environment. So, you know, if you want a spacecraft, for example, to go really quick, you shrink it to that scale where it's where its field geometry is is um, not interacting with the environment and you can go whatever speed you want to go at. You know, mass and light speed and relativity stuff is no longer applicable, and in fact is wrong uh, in in general. So what determines how fast something goes at is how big the field geometry is to interact with other matter structure that's around it. Um, the less interaction you get, the faster you can go. The more interaction you have, the slower you go. It's just, you know, but, you know, is there a speed limit? I don't think so. The speed limit due to light, well, the speed of a light photon is something that's due to the light photon construction itself. It's only applicable to a light photon. And the speed of a light photon changes depending on the material through which it travels. The aether being a non, not as interactive environment, the, the, the photon will travel faster um, if it's going through a, a matter structure, you know, much more condensed, like a liquid or something like that, it'll go slower. Um, so conductors, light will travel in a conductor. You get a piece of copper wire and you, you can fire light down the wire, but it's, it travels at nine tenths C, not, uh, and C is the vacuum speed. So if we go up into space, the reason why the uh, interferometer, the vertical interferometer that's looking for the aether works, the further up you go, the less matter there is and the more ether structure there is. Correct. Correct. And, that, and people don't know, if you're, if you're just tuning in to our world uh, here, uh, people, then you can, um, you can verify what he's talking about. Uh, well, I do cover it in the new paper. Um, I have a, a link directly about the, uh, the, the second verification of the vertical interferometer, but you can also, um, let's see here, from the researchers, if you go to Robotai and you go to his uh, channel, there's a documentary. And in fact, I think if, I, if you just click this Robotai, um, I think that there is. Yeah, the, the, it's definitely the, it was that the, um, the experiment, the vertical experiment was done somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, yes. 
Yes. Well, I have a link somewhere on the site to the Russian uh, documentary. You could probably just type Russian documentary up here. And uh, uh, well, one day it'll end up in a paper, but it'll probably not be in English. And that's a real uh, shame because there's a bias against, uh, you know, uh, Eastern European science uh, because of the whole Royal Society thing. And that is holding things back because the Michelson Morley was done 137 years ago. So thankfully, I do cite this stuff in my in my paper so that people can get uh, direct. And that's where I would recommend it, you know, it's because I that's why I include it in 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 this discussion. Because uh, the 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 Michelson Morley has in fact set us back by so so over many years, um, I, I I I include also a link directly to Stephen Hawking's paper as well as mentioning that he was wrong. He had the he he his calculations are actually weak too weak uh, for what these uh, uh, Bostickian superplasmoids are doing uh, because they're not black holes. And I've decided I am going to go ahead and make a. Uh, a paper about the uh, the asymmetry of this because there's a whole lot of fake news uh, about how uh, they've they've proven the accretion disk and everything. You can see here as I hold the cross over that the image. center of this plasmoid, it is not symmetric. That image is computer generated, correct? And Robert Lee has already given it a debunking mechanism because the the uh, optics that was used to determine that structure doesn't have the resolution required to produce that image in the first place. So, you know, it's it's totally fake news. It's all um, fake news. And so, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry about that, people, but it's it's just uh, the, the lies of the system. Just that's just the way they are. They are. They just continuously walk stream and then they're only going to get paid an income if they continue the bullshit story. But anyway, but I, do, I do conclude this paper by suggesting uh that and here's the here's the the documentary so if, if people come here to page 12 and they click uh this uh the uh, footnote 70 it'll take you to the documentary with the the it's in russian but it has subtitles uh enjoy it now before it somehow gets removed from the internet we still haven't gotten a, a copy of haruni's paper uh since it's been mysteriously disappeared from the internet so the the internet is not permanent. It is a it's a very poor long term memory storage device. Very good for for uh, quickly exchanging information. Very bad on keeping that information around for long enough to verify things. Um, but so we we've got that now. That, that's part of why I wanted to write this paper. There were a number of good reasons to write this paper and to put this together uh, to update and and let people know we're keeping an eye on uh, their shenanigans. Um, this table, I, I left out the the strike through. So now we have two instances of this in the conquering the solar system paper. I went ahead and put strike through through the falsified ones rather than include the whole falsification uh, table. But uh, this falsification table, I reckon we could probably add some more things to it since uh, since 2019. Uh, I've only added the, the uh, since 2018. I've only added the 2019 and 2021. Uh, two falsifications, and I, I reckon there's probably been a whole number of things that happened in 2020 that we all missed because we were distracted with COVID. But the other thing I want to say is the Mickelson Morley experiment only proved that light from the source um, couldn't, the, the Doppler effect that they claim is existent there, couldn't be proven from, from, from the experiment. Uh, the Chinese whispers bullshit that goes with it, the, the reinterpretation of the data, the claim that it proved that the Aether didn't exist, that is a made up story. If we go to Hubble's papers, it's claimed that Hubble said that, you know, the red shift is uh, an indication of a Big Bang universe, but that's not what Hubble wrote in the paper. What Hubble wrote in the paper is that if if this spectrum drift is due to uh, to 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 um, redshift, then we have a Big Bang universe. If it's not due to redshift, then we don't have a Big Bang universe. And people are being saying, "Oh, Hubble was all for a Big Bang universe. He's the Hubble constant and all the rest of it." He, to his deathbed, did not know which way he wanted to flip on this one, and he was not convinced that he was 
uh, his, his, his understanding was correct. But everybody else is saying Hubble did this, Hubble did that. You know, it's, it's total made up crap. Uh, you, if you want to know the real deal, go to the real paper and read it and study it. Einstein never said that the speed limit of matter in the universe is light speed. And I had, when I made that claim, I had 12 or 13 PhD scientists out there going, oh, bullshit. And I said, go away and read his actual paper. Prove to me the line in his paper where he made that statement. That the, the 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 absolute speed of matter is light light speed, and you won't find it. And the reason why I know it's not not to be found is my colleague has read the papers and he's he's, he's adamant about this. And given given the sort of things that he's been correct about in the past, then fine. There is no experiment that has been done in the world since Ampere made a claim that a moving electric charge produces a magnetic field. There has been no experiment to confirm that observation, that speculation. So, you know, we, we, we've got to be very careful about what is claimed versus what is fact. And and this this black hole stuff, there are a lot of claims being made and, and none of them stack up, like gravity waves. If gravity waves are due to gravitational particles, why the hell are they claiming that an electromagnetic laser beam detects a gravity wave when gravity waves are not electromagnetic. Right. You know, there's, Correct. there's a whole bunch of bullshit that's coming out that just it's, doesn't stand up to the logic. It's all the reason on why I'm is I've got billions of dollars spent on things. Lot, lots People's of flim flammery and, and uh, shenanigans, uh, you know, hand waving, essentially. Um, well, it's hand waving to guarantee my, you know, Eighty thousand or ninety thousand dollar salary. Uh, that well, that's true, and uh, we certainly uh, wish they would cut it out because it is actually dangerous uh, and, and certainly wasteful. Stop funding these experiments. If they reckon they're so right, then they can spend their own bloody money instead of the taxpayers' money. Well, this would be. I think I reckon this would be a very uh, interesting experiment to do because I don't think it's actually going to be that expensive. Uh, in the first place, and secondly, I reckon this this is a good opportunity for them to potentially uh, detect uh, the emergence of light from the ether directly, or, or maybe the source of energy, which instead of calling it zero point or vacuum energy, I would say that it's energy from the uh, the counter space, but. Well, um, I don't believe in a counter space because it's just space. That's fine. Right. Well, that's, that, that's fine. It's a conceptual. It's a conceptual difference. But uh, it, I would refer people if people want to understand the counter space, then they then they should refer to to Ken Wheeler and Eric Dollard. Um, yeah, but in negative space as well. So you know, I just have a problem with the idea. Um, yeah, I understand. At least it's not dark photons, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, but it's another element that I wanted to touch on. The vacuum energy and the zero point energy are actually opposite charge maximums. In other words, one's a, a negative value and the other's a positive value. And these these things come, these are being expressed by the behavior of the aethic structure itself. It's a it produces a, an electromagnetic oscillation mechanism. And if I gave it the positive direction of electric and magnetic fields at maxima, it, it's called uh, the zero point energy. If I go to the minima of those two electric and magnetic field structures, it's called the, uh, the zero point energy, which whichever way around it is. So there are measures for these maxima and maximas that occur. And the only difference is that it's an electromagnetic maximum and an electromagnetic minimum, and the two go together. They're not separate energy fields. They are a, the consequence of a, uh, of a complex where we see a maximum in, in the positive direction and a maximum in the negative direction. Mm. And they are also polarized. In other words, it behaves a lot like light does. In other words, uh, if I'm negative and it, it, it maximizes in one degree, but the when, I, when it goes to the minimum uh, um, 
get maxima, the whole thing has rotated 180 degrees uh, to a different phase. So we really don't understand what's going on. We, that, that, would, uh, that would be one area we could definitely conclude. We, we really don't know what's going on. Um, I like this yep. experiment in that, that they're proposing a, a method. Of course, it's all quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah. Philosophically, there may be some problems, but I more or less just have a problem with the ethics of, of claiming that you've already produced something because you've created the concept of, of the experiment. Uh, and then that, but that may be how they're attempting to sell it uh, in order to guarantee that they'll get the funding. And that well, I have a problem with that still because they're pumping out the propaganda ahead of time, which reminds me of when they uh, they couldn't find uh, dark energy, so they started uh, creating this concept of new dark energy. And uh, that that's a letter that I, I uh, responded to already. Um, it's just to, like one tree, right? He's trying to produce the Big Bang because he is a religious belief that that says there was a creation in the universe and Big Bang gives you that. So he was, he was using his religious belief, belief to produce a science, um, a claimed science, this theory, which wasn't, it wasn't science. It was total opinion and not much in the way of evidence. So we, we've got to remember that our knowledge, understand, the way we come to understand things is we make a guess, we, we have an opinion about how it works, and then we go and build a device, hopefully, that'll prove that our opinion at least holds up. And if the device proves that our opinion's total garbage, then our opinion's wrong, because, you know, what really happens is, is, is the evidence. And we really don't have the evidence that's claimed, you know. Everybody's claiming that the GPS system was built using um, relative uh, relativity basis, and that's total bullshit because of our guys that built it said we use straight up ordinary Newtonian mechanics to produce the GPS system and uh, the guys from the quantum world who wanted to support relativity came along and jiggery poker with the answer and turned it, it, into it, it, it reminds me of the photos of all these politicians meeting to discuss the sea level rise and then you go back a hundred years and the, the the photograph of the of the site shows the sea level is the exact same as it was <laughs> in the modern photo. Well, maybe um, we should go back into the uh, ancient past when the sea level raised 300 metres and talk about sea level change photographs of that period. But, you know, we need a time machine to achieve that sort of thing. Yeah. But, know, if you uh, want to talk about real sea level change, we need to get the facts right, and we haven't. That's, that's correct. Um, so I do want to uh, uh, remind people of this Dark Matter series paper. Uh, where I start in, I talk about how I predicted that they would you know, they would start talking about charged dark matter, and boom, within the year they they were doing so. Um, then I, I go over Bose-Einstein condensates, which are a real thing, but probably because they're just a form of ultra cold plasma. Uh, then I talk about a, a whole series of pseudosciences. Uh, we have negative mass, dark photons, and then this uh, guy wrote an acoust acoustic shock wave. Uh, cosmology paper and Big Bang. And my problem, of course, is that the, uh, the concept of acoustics in space is incredibly pop problematic. Um, well, not actually. Not actually. You've got, okay, the, the issue with space when we're talking about matter, well, we've got the aether, which is, you know, 99. Well, but he, didn't, but he didn't talk about the ether. You see, if he, if he had talked about the ether, that'd be one thing. He didn't talk yeah, about it. But but you also have the the occasional ion. Was it the density of one ion per cubic centimeter? Even even at that low density, you can still get sound kinetic sound transmission in that dent thing. It's just the loudness of the sound isn't going to be there. But uh, you know, sound 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 really fundamentally, given that the particles involved have electromagnetic structure will maybe i haven't uh, explained yes. I, of course you can look at the paper but my point yeah. is you're not going to get electric you're not going to get filamentary structure the same way that you do with electromagnetism and Birkeland currents with acoustics but acoustics will still work in in space environments a vacuum environment so called but it's not actually vacuum yeah, it's when just, when when it's when it's not, 
when, the energy when, when they're able to interact with each other. But the problem is that that you're trying to get acoustics to move through large voids uh, in space and create yeah. filamentary structures. It's just not going to happen. Only way, the only way acoustics will work in space effectively is with the the oscillation that it can occur due to electromagnetic structure moving around. There you go. And that's Fields. that. That's the, that's the point. And, now, to, that, to his credit, the guy the guy uh, had a very pleasant uh, dialogue with me. So, you know, I don't want to I don't want to knock him too hard. But uh, uh, you know, sure. it, it, there's some problems with creating cosmology uh, surrounding sound, primarily instead of electromagnetism, rather than going the other way, which it should be that the acoustic follows the electromagnetism. Correct. Dead right. Yeah. We know that and, matter uh, has, has electromagnetic structure and it will oscillate and produce sound. It will produce light or produce all sorts of things. Um, it's, we've got to look at it the correct way and and not get lost in what I right. call the wow factor. We it's, find sort of, we, it's sort of like fusion comes from the electrical processes, not the electricity coming from the fusion, which is how they're now they're, they're now repositioning the sun to be electric, but it's electric because of the fusion, and which is yeah. total horseshit. Yeah, uh, and then and then I go through the dark matter scatter, then you know cover neutrinos, neutron stars, axions, and then how they're just ripping everything apart. Then I have a very hilarious paper. I just want to put a. a uh, I introduced this concept of of, of gnomes to uh, cold dark matter. My joke, the joke here is that they've they've pivoted. Cold dark matter now can pull or push. And uh, my point is that uh, you might as well just go with gnomes because they have hands and feet. Um, <laughs> and and that, that's one of my favorite uh, papers that I've done. And then the new dark energy, and now we have. Uh, this uh, concept of getting some light for free without any kind of uh, ether or source. So we're, we're continuing to, uh, to to track their BS is is the uh, the main point. So I hope people will pay a little attention to these papers. They're all logical. Everything in them I break down. Every time I break down uh, an article, I, I slice it into little pieces to look at. Does what they say make sense? Because it doesn't seem to be what anybody else is doing. The other thing I would say on papers in general, don't rely on the paper having got it right. Go and look at the quoted references and see if they apply to the paper. I've made a comment on, on saying that the paper goes up for you know peer review. It is my claim that the author himself of, or themselves of the paper have not likely read the papers they quote. Certainly not all of them, that's for sure. Well, yeah. The person who is their supervisor for the paper or their mentor or whatever is unlikely to have read the paper's references either. And when it goes to peer review, the chances of the reviewer having read the paper's references is almost non-existent. And when it gets published, the chances of the reader of that paper going away and actually checking the references themselves is unlikely because, you know, we're talking, you're talking lots and lots. You know, if you want to reference Maxwell, Maxwell's uh, uh, references, any any reference to Maxwell, you're looking at 2,000 pages of reading to verify the claims that the paper might be relying upon. And show me the show me the person who's Eric actually Dollar, just apparently Eric Dollard because he wanted to, he he read the 2,000 pages of Steinmetz. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've read the two thousand pages. My colleagues read the two thousand pages, but my question is: is all the scientists out there have done electromagnetics in any way, shape, or form? How many of them have read the two thousand pages, studied it, and understood it? You know, the, the claim is that Maxwell was using quaternions. Nobody can understand this. So you know, it's all well and good to quote things, but you know, the point is: did you actually read them, and is it of any value? <laughs> It's certainly a very, very few. Um, with that note, I want to wrap up because it's late here. It's been a three-hour call, and uh, it was a good show. Um, I will put this one up, and uh, I don't know if you guys uh, do Turkey Day there, but uh, happy Thanksgiving no matter what. And yeah. uh, also happy, enjoy Thanksgiving any, anyway. happy Thanksgiving to anybody who could uh, be listening to this. I will post it in the morning so that it uploads for people. Okay. All right. We'll catch you on later. No worries. No worries. Catch you later, Ramon. Catch you later, All Robert. Right. Yeah, you're out yeah. as well, eh? Yeah. Okay. All right.